dans moi c'est Thank you, y'a dans moi c'est Humbly, I ask that we begin this grand commemorative event in the name of God Almighty, Otredi Ampong, as we are led in prayer by the Reverend Dr. Achampong, chaplain of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. May I please crave your indulgence that we rise as we pray. Almighty and ever-living God, Indeed, it is in you we live, move, and have our being. And therefore, it is meet and right that as we have gathered here, we acknowledge you and give you all the glory and the praise for your goodness and your mercies towards us as individuals, for your goodness and your mercies towards us as a nation, for your goodness and your mercies towards us as a sentiment. And we give you all the glory for this gathering an all-important one, which seeks to bring glory and honor to your name. At this time, I want to thank you, O oh God, for all that you have done for us, especially in this commemorative occasion. I want to thank you for what you have done for Asante Man. I want to thank you for all the leaders you have given to this great nation over the past years that the nation of Asante Man came into existence. We bless your name for our current leader of Asantiman Otunfo Osei Tutu II. We give you all the glory, O oh God, for the history, the very rich history you've given to Asantiman, even as we've gathered here today to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Sagranti War, which also coincides with the Silver Jubilee of uh, Otunfo Osei Tutu. We commit this symposium and the book launching that we're going to have today before you, committing all facilitators of this great program before you, that your spirit will guide, lead, and direct us so that this reflective moment will guide us even into the future, a future of hope and prosperity and progress, not only for our sentiment, but for our nation as a whole. We praise and bless you for answering our prayer because you have asked for this and many more blessings through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please let's sit. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Achampong, Chaplain of the KNUST. Nananum, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a warm cultural welcome to Asantiman.
the richness of our culture and the many traditions that have stood the test of time, the Mamre Agofuma of the Kumasi Cultural Center, also known as the Center for National Culture Asante. Please, a round of applause for them. Ago, Ago, Ago. If you're joining us here at the Great Hall of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, this hallowed institution of learning in Kumasi, the heart of Asantiman, or if you're joining us on radio, television, or online, it is because you believe history is not the path left by the past. It influences the present and can shape our future. My name is Jerry Edem Koku Ajololo, a son of the Volta, and today by the special grace of God, a loyal subject of our King, wise and merciful, the Otunfo Oseitutu II, Asantehene. I have known fewer honors in my lifetime than this to stand in the name of our king, as I say good morning to you all, the great and good of our sentiment, sons and daughters, friends and well-wishers. We greet you in that one word, which when spoken everywhere around the world, conveys the truest and warmest expression of love and hospitality. We say, Akwaba. And because I'm your son, you say, Yaoba. Akwaba. We meet here today on this great day in history for a symposium on the 150th anniversary of the Sagrenti War and the launch of the book, History of the Ashanti by Otunfo Se Ajiman Prempe II, as the first in the series of many events marking the Silver Jubilee of Otunfo Oseitutu II the 16th Asantehene and the current occupant of the Golden Stool. Today, we take pride in welcoming sons and daughters who have come from far and near to add their weight to this glorious celebration. Allow me the privilege of acknowledging, especially amongst us, our guest of honor, a son of Asantiman, MP for Busumche, and the Honorable Minister for Education, the Honorable Dr. Yao Osei Educhu. Asante Man is pleased to welcome her own MP for Minshia South and Minister for Energy, the Honorable Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe. <laughs> we receive with great delight the MP for Tano North, the Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, the Honorable Frida Prempe. <laughs> the Regional Minister joins us in solidarity, the Honorable Simon. Jose Mensa. With great joy, we receive the immediate past Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, His Lordship Justice Kwesi Enin Yeboah. It is with profound joy that we welcome our keynote speaker, now a son of Asantiman, the Professor Tom Makaski. He joins us with his lovely wife, Mrs. Lynn Bryden McCaskey. Thank you very much. It will be lost on me not to acknowledge Excellencies, members of the diplomatic community, our MPs, MCs, and DCs, Nananum, and esteemed chiefs and queens from Asantiman and beyond, our religious leaders, the moderators and panelists for this morning's symposium, 
the Vice Chancellor of the KNUST, Professor Mrs. Rita Akusia Dixon, the Pro Vice Chancellor, <laughs> distinguished faculty and staff of the KNUST, and other distinguished members of academia who have come from far and near, captains of industry, heads, teachers, students, and pupils of selected schools, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. We say receive the warm and generous hospitality of Asante Man. This historic program is live around the world on radio, Opimsuo Radio, the official mouthpiece of Asante Man, and on Asasi Radio 99.7, on TV, Oyopa TV, and numerous other affiliate platforms, both online and on traditional media. In welcoming us officially to this august event, it's my pleasure to invite the Chairman of the Council of State and the Chair of the Silver Jubilee Planning Committee, Nana Otru Sribo Jabinghine. Tum for Osel to two as Antehene. Honorable Ministers of State, Honorable Immediate Past Chief Justice, Regional Minister, Ananum, Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, my alma mater, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My duty is to welcome you, and since in a traditional setting, saying welcome means akwaba, I thought that my duty would be done if I just uttered the word akwaba, and I would then resume my seat. But when the tomb is around, you cannot be very brief. You have to go to town and say a few more things. So I'll say a few more things, and if there are a few, just pardon me that there are a few. I speak on behalf of the Otumfo Osei Tutu II Jubilee Planning Committee. This committee has been put together to celebrate the 20 meritorious, momentous years of Otumfo's accession to the Golden Stool. By a very happy coincidence, this year, the Silver Jubilee year, also coincides with two seminal events in the annals of Ashanti history. These are the 150 years of the Saganet Wesley War, the Saganti War, as we call it in P, a corruption of the word Saganet Wesley, and also the 100 years of the repatriation of King Nana, Ajima, Nana Prempe I from Seychelles after 21, 28 years of exile. Now, this function is the first of a series of activities to mark the celebrations, the, to commemorate the activities as I have enumerated. Taking them in chronological order, the 6th of February was exactly, today was exactly 150 years ago when British forces under Sir Garnet Woosley invaded Kumasi, looted the palace of precious regalia, and completely burned Kumasi down, and left the town smoldering after their invasion. This morning, we have assembled an array of eminent people who are knowledgeable in the Ashanti in Ashanti history and customs to 
regale us with the causes of the war, the cause of the war, and Asante after the war. It is instructive to add that since Otum Fourth installment from 25 years ago, the issue of the return of the regalia that was looted by the British has engaged his highest attention and he has never relented in pursuing this mission and has been locking the doors of the British establishment with a view to getting them to return the regalia. By a happy coincidence, the British finally have answered our prayers, albeit in some veiled way. But half a loaf, they say, is better than none. However, some of the regalia which were taken to the US are here and going to be here until time and circumstances shall be no more. So, as I said, the jewel in the crown of the celebration will be, first and foremost, the return of the regalia from the U U.S. or from America, which will be handed over to Otum for the day after tomorrow on Thursday at the Kutukudin Deba. And then the return of the regalia at the British Museum and at the British, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum on the Akwasida Deba, which is slated for the 12th of May. We hope that if, even if it's a loan, it will be a permanent loan to us. <laughs> As I said earlier, we have two functions this morning. One is a symposium, and the other is the launching of the book on the history of Asante. As you all know, before the written word was introduced into our educational system or into our culture, the mode of transmitting our history, our values, our culture, and our morals and other things was through the spoken word. In the evening, the old men will assemble the young ones and then tell them about the walls of old, our customs, our traditions, their games, and other things. So it was a compulsory for children to attend to these calls. Hence, we coined the word titika asum. It has been corrupted to titika asum. But it means titika asum. That is, the past resides in the years. However, with the introduction of the written word and calligraphy, the ear became less receptive to Tite, and therefore new modes had to be introduced to maintain and retain our history and to transmit it from one generation to the other. We were fortunate to have Otum Fosse at my Prempe, the second Asante Hene, the first formally educated Asante Hene to ascend the stool in 1931, and through the dint of his hard work, was able to restore the Confederacy, which had been, which had been disbanded in 1896, in 1935. Immediately upon ascending the stool, he felt that our modes needed to change. So, whilst our children were going to school, and for that matter, we, they were not getting the tuition that they, they, they deserved and they had to have, he assembled other eminent people, the Asafwajais, the EK, uh, CEO says, the IK Adjimans, and others, to give our history the benefit of being put down in writing so as to remove the inconsistencies and the contradictions that attend to transmitting history 
orally. This was indeed a formidable task which lasted several years. And it is a happy coincidence that he had Professor Tom Maskaski, an eminent son of Asante, who though has a, uh, he's been with Ashanti for over 50 years, since he came to Ashanti in 1968. Virtually a year passes without his coming down to us and uh, writing about Asante and all our histories and everything. And Professor Bakaski has you know, accepted to edit this book. And this is a veritable history of Asante from our own perspectives, without any biases, without any contradictions, and without any enlargements or any diminutions. And the second aspect of the program would be to uh, auction the book. And I'm sure that you have come down with your deep pockets and with your fat checkbooks so as to give the auction the necessary support that it deserves. I'm sure that those, who have, those of you who would buy at the highest price will have autographed uh, copies by Otumfo himself. So as I said earlier, I welcome you. I, said, I think I've said a few things, and if my few is not enough, I think I'll take leave and then give the floor to our uh, eminent uh, MC to continue the program. Thank you all very much for coming, and we hope you will enjoy the proceedings this morning. Thank you very much. His wise and warm words of welcome have set the tone for a long day of reflections, learnings, and insights. Please help me appreciate once again the Drabbing Hene, the Chair of the Council of State, and the Chair of the Silver Jubilee Planning Committee, Nana Otuo Srebo II. It has fallen to a very distinguished son of Asantiman to chair this morning's auspicious event. To introduce him, make welcome the Kwemuhene Achamfo Asafo Boache Ajiman Bonsu. Thank you very much, MC. Your Royal Majesty, Utunfo Osechu II, Asante Hine. Nana Utu Sribo II, Yamimai Hine, and Chairman of the Utunfo Silver Jubilee Committee. Honorable Minister for Education, Dr. Oseya Waduchum. Honorable Minister for Energy, Matthew Opoku Prempe. Nananum Amahine, Nananum Distinguished Speakers, VC, the press, ladies and gentlemen, I will observe all protocols. It is normal for such an auspicious occasion to have someone who can ably steer the affairs for the day. It therefore gives me a great pleasure to introduce the chairman of the occasion. Our chairman for this August function is a native of Tuasi. He entered the University of Ghana in 1976 to read law and was called to the bar as a barrister in 1981. He worked at the Attorney General's office for his national service. He was a private legal practitioner and was the president of the Eastern Region Bar Association. He was appointed as a High Court judge in 2002, and because of his hard work, he was promoted to the Court of Appeal just a year after that. In 2008, 
he was appointed as a Supreme Court judge. He held several positions in the judicial service and other judicial bodies. He was the chairman of the Legal Aid Commission, the chairman of the Council for Law Reporting, the chairman of the Disciplinary Committee of the General Legal Council, and in 2002, he was appointed as the Chief Justice of Ghana. He retired in May 2003, 2023, after 21 years of distinguished career on the bench. Aside being an accomplished legal professional, our chairman is also a football enthusiast. No wonder he was elected as the chairman of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee and also became the first African to be elected to occupy one of the FIFA judicial bodies. He is married with four children. Please join me in with a big applause to welcome our chairman for the occasion in the person of the former Chief Justice, Enim Yeboa. Ladies and gentlemen, your chairman, chairman, your audience. Thank you very much. And now, may Lord Justice, the chair, your audience. Your Royal Majesty, the two for Asante Hine, the Honorable Regional Minister, the Honorable Members, uh, sorry, Honorable Ministers of State, the Vice Chancellor, Nananum, Amai Hine, Abrimpong, the Linguist, the Vice Chancellor, and the Pro Vice Chancellor, the members of the Academia here in present, eminent members who are all here as university community. I am indeed honored to be the chairman of this all important occasion. This is an occasion which marks the 150th anniversary of the Sagranti War. Some of us just learn, decided to learn history in person. Unfortunately, we didn't know the inner details of the war, what caused it, and the cause of the war, and as the chairman of the occasion said, the end result for this, our great kingdom. Yes, we are here today to take stock of what happened about 150 years ago. If you look at the brochure, we have assembled eminent speakers who have amassed enough knowledge to share with us. History, they say, must be accurate, free from all distortions. It may be told that in narrating history, there are bitter ones which should not be ignored. There are sweeter ones which we should all swallow. At times, we have to swallow a bitter pill just to cure ourselves. So, my Lord, Nananum, distinguished elders of the Asante I am here to humbly accept the invitation to be the chairman of this great occasion, and I'm grateful to Otun for the and the chairman of the planning committee for giving me this honor at this great and memorable occasion. So, I am here to serve you, and I think you all cooperate and uh, have a fruitful discussion as the history starts to unfold for our consumption, I am grateful and I take this opportunity to thank you once again. Thank you very much. His Lordship Justice.
We see Enini Abua is our chairperson for this august occasion. Please, a round of applause. We thank you for accepting to chair, and we know that your great years of experience, your grace and aplomb will come to bear on today's experience. We now move to the symposium. To introduce our keynote speaker, it's my pleasure to invite Otunfos Hiahine, who is the chair of the Otunfo Foundation. Make welcome Nana Professor Ohineba Boache Eji Wahine II. Thank you very much, Jerry. The Royal Majesty Otunfo Oseti II, the second, Asante Hene, Nana Otio Srebo, the second, Chairman of the Jubilee Planning Committee, Mr. Chairman, Chief Justice, and Abua, Honorable Minister of Education, Ya Osei Edichum, Minister of, Minister of Energy, Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe, Doctor. Regional Minister of Ashanti, Vice Chancellor KNUSD, Nananum, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Allow me a few minutes to introduce our keynote speaker for this landmark symposium on the Sagrenti War. We have today, to, with our with us today, no other person than the illustrious and prolific historian, Professor Thomas C. Makarski also known as Kwaku Makaski. <laughs> he was trying to get close to Kwakudia, to for Kwakudia. Well, Professor Makaski is a professor of Asante History, Center of West African Studies, Birmingham University, United Kingdom, and professor of History of Africa, School of Oriental and African Studies, London University. He retired 2011. He first worked in an, on Asante in 1968 at a tender age of 22 and was the youngest faculty member in the history department of the University of Ghana. He spent the whole of his life working, researching, writing, and publishing on Asante. He has written two monographs on Asante, State and Society in Pre-Colonial Asante, and Asante Identities, History and Modernity in an African Village. He has also published over 80 papers on Asante, 50 of which have been republished in his Asante Kingdom of Gold, Essays in the History of African Culture. The history of Asante kings and the whole country itself. Knowing the importance of research done by the committee that, convened, that was convened by Otunfo Osei Ajiman Prempe II, which started way back in 1939. He singularly edited the final volumes of the typescripts and manuscripts, which culminated in the final publication of this timeless piece we have with us today, History of Asante by Otunfo Nana Osei Ajiman Prempe II. His curriculum vita is replete with anecdotes. And I had a few minutes with him. I asked him, what was your best moments in Kumasi? He served when he served as the royal golf caddy for Prempe II. I believe that's where he got a lot of his notes too. Today, his keynote address is on the Segrenti War and its aftermath and reflections. Please join me to welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Kwaku Makaski. Nana Atumpo, Nana Noom, distinguished guests, and the public, I am very honored indeed to make this short presentation about the Sagranti War. 
I want to start very quickly with a review of the reign of Quaker Joe Adjaman, who died in 1867. The reason I'm doing this is simple. Quaker Joe Adjaman was the most pernickety and stickler sort of man when it came to the law. He is known as Quaker Anansi, Quaker the Wise. He is known as Adjaman Bambuo. He was somebody who really, really enforced the laws of Asante. In the process, he gathered together a great deal of money in gold dust, principally, but also in specie and other things. And I say all this because I want to underline and emphasize something that I think has been overlooked. When Nana Quikadu Adjaman died in 1867, he left behind a very great deal of money. And I will give you some idea of this. The money was stored in three places. It was stored in the Adakakase, the great chest of the treasury. It was stored in the Asantehini's country palace at Abarasto, and it was stored elsewhere at Breman. The sums involved, I've been able to calculate because we know the dimensions of the Adakakase, and with assistance from members of the British Mint, chemists, engineers, the kind of people who can know about the science of gold and the measurement of gold and all the rest of it. We have calculated that the amount of gold contained in the Adakasi alone at Quigadur's death was in excess of 400,000 ounces. Now, the 4,000, 100,000 ounces in 1867 were worth 1.2 million pounds sterling. But you know what's happened to gold in our lifetime. The contemporary, the current value of the Adaka Kasi is somewhere over two billion pounds. A lot of money. Now he left this money to his successor, Kofi Kakari. And Kofi Kakari was a wastrel. He distributed money to buy popularity, and he was eventually destooled at the end of the Segrenti War. I'll come to the war in a moment, but let me simply say that, to underline what I've already said, that the attempt to get back the treasures looted from Kumasi by Sir Garnet Wolseley in 1874 takes no account, because it cannot, of the gold in gold dust and unworked gold that the British must have carried away with them. We don't know about this. Of course we don't know, because it was loot, private loot, and so it is separate from the cultural artifacts that Nana Tumfo is trying to retrieve for the Asantiban and retrieve for the Republic of Ghana. Now, the war itself is often referred to generally as a colonial war, one of Britain's first colonial wars. But we can refine that a little. We can refine it, in fact, quite a lot. In the 1860s and 1870s, Britain came to realize that it did not have a first-class army. In fact, it was an army composed of people rather like in the 18th century, who had bought their commissions. And this had to change, and change it did, and the leader of this change was Sir Garnet Wolseley. Assisted by the War Secretary, Edward Cardwell, he modernized the army, and of course, this didn't mean just modernizing how it was run. It was modernized from the benefits of the Industrial Revolution. And I will name only a couple of things here. The British came to Asante in 1874 to make war, 1873 to make war, with telegraph communications, with people on board the ships who brought the officers to advise them on what Asante was like, 
in other words, intelligence gathering on a new and unusual scale, they also had with them, and perhaps most crucially, Snyder rifles. These were the result of revolutionary developments in armaments. And unlike the flintlocks used by the Asante or the muskets used by the Asante, these were very accurate, long-range repeating rifles, the first, or at least one of the first, among modern rifles. So they came, and they came with all this in their baggage and their intentions. Now, Walsley himself was determined to rise to be head of the British Army, which he eventually did. And he brought with him to Asante a group of officers known as the Walsley Ring, the Ring of Friends, who would rise with him. So there was a very personal motive in Walsley fighting this war and being seen to have fought it and won it for himself, for Britain, for Queen Victoria and the rest. And we have proof of this. This was the first war in which the general in command, Walsley, was accompanied by large numbers of the British press. This war was reported very extensively in England with jubilation, of course, when Kumasi was taken. Now, the Asante themselves, Kwekadua Ajiman, for the 30 years of his reign, had maintained a hands-off policy towards any of the states south of the Pra and the Europeans. There were no real or significant south of the Pra in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Kwekadu Ajiman's view of things was that Asante ruled inland itself and its northern dependencies, and the British ruled the whites on the coast. So it was a world vision that really contrasted the two worlds of Africa and Europe. He was the ruler of Africa, and they were the rulers of the south, led by the whites. But of course, this was nothing to do with what Wolseley wanted or what the British government backed him to want. And so, despite the fact that in 1873, the Asante Hini withdrew those military forces he had on the borders of the Pra and southwards into almost Fanti, he withdrew them and tried to make peace with the British. Wolseley absolutely refused. There is no other word for it, he turned him down flat because Wolseley and the British government were determined to have their war. Now you can imagine the kind of propaganda that was put about by uh, 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 the British about Asante. A savage despotism, blood running in the streets, endless sacrifices, barbarians, racism in short, and very highly developed Victorian racism. So Wolseley crossed the Pra and went to Kumasi. Now, one of the things that's almost never noticed about the occupation is that he was only there for a couple of days. He was frightened that the Asante would counterattack. He was frightened that the army he led would come down, come down with tropical diseases. And so, having secured his victory, he scurried back to the coast very, very quickly stopping only at Fomina, where he sent to enforce a treaty he had drawn up with the Asantehini Kofi Kakari. The treaty was a treaty of, and you may and are allowed to laugh at this point, the treaty was a treaty of permanent peace between Britain and Asante. And he asked that Kofi Kakari, as a sign of goodwill, hand over 50,000 ounces of gold to show his good faith. He never did that, but that's another story. Now, in the occupation of Kumasi, the place was, as previous speakers have said to you, the city was burned and comprehensively looted. 
The Aban, the big story building constructed by Asante Hini Yossi Bonso as he in 1819 to 22. The King's Own Palace, they were all ransacked by the British. Now, I've told you the amount of gold that was floating about Asante at this time in dust. We have no account of this. Soldiers just filled their pockets or took it away in little wrappings and things like that. So we just do not know about that, but we do know about the cultural treasures. And I just want to mention two of them in passing, and they're simply this. In the Wellcome Collection, the foundation in London, there is the largest gold mask known from sub-Saharan Africa. It is a portrait of the Bandahini Warosa defeated and killed by the Asante Hiniosa Quadwo in the 1760s, and it weighs over two kilos. Its current value in gold alone, never mind its aesthetic value, its cultural value, its cultural value, its, its value in gold alone, is over 80,000 pounds sterling. The other piece of loot that I want to particularly emphasize was not taken in 1874. It was taken in 1896 when the British returned and arrested Asante Hini Adjiman Prempe. Now, you would think this was nothing. Somebody must have just picked it up and taken it away. It was a brass basin called Ayakasi, which was displayed before the Royal Mausoleum at Bantama and was part of the practices of recalling the ancestral monarchs of Asante. It is simply a brass basin, but the British took it away. When Prempe came back in 1929, he wrote to the British and tried to get this battered brass basin restored. And the British wouldn't give him it. And it is still in Britain at the United Services, the Army Museum in London. The war itself had a catastrophic effect on Asante. Catastrophic in the sense that, well, in a number of senses. Above all, it shattered unity. Asante works best when it's united under its king. The British seduced away and led away large numbers of defectors into the Gold Coast colony, and Asante descended into a period of anarchy. Now, you all know that this anarchy was capped. Its lowest point was the civil war that occurred in Asante between 1883 and 1888. There is no doubt at all that the British encouraged resistance to Kumasi, whether by giving arms, which was illegal, of course, and which they never talked about publicly, money, or just general support, and above all, refuge to those who opposed the Asantehini in the Gold Coast colony, which they had established in 1874 after the Segrenti War. I haven't got much time left, so I will simply cover what is left of the story. In 1892, the British wrote to Asante Hini Ajiman Prempe I, offering him British protection. That is, that Asante, which he was trying to restore to its former status after the Civil War, that Asante should come under formal British protection. Ajiman Prempe simply refused. He said, no, we're an independent kingdom. Not only did he refuse, he sent an embassy to London to underline his point that Asante was an independent kingdom. The embassy spent some time in London, but the British government refused to see it. And while it refused to see it, it was planning a second invasion of Asante. And this occurred as the embassy returned to the coast and the British advanced on Kibasi again in 1896. There, Adjiman Prempe was faced by one of the greatest challenges 
that any of Santini has faced. Should he fight? Should he not? The solution he came up with is beyond admirable. He knew that after the Sagrenti War and after the Civil Wars, he knew perfectly well that if the British unleashed their military power now on what was a weakened Asante, people would suffer in enormous numbers. So instead of permitting this to happen, he decided to surrender himself and his mother and various other of his dignitaries and his family to the British, provided they prosecuted no military action in Asante. So he was taken away as a British captive, and the rest of the story you know. He remained on the coast until 1900, and then he was sent to Sierra Leone, and finally to the Seychelles and the Indian Ocean, from which he did not return until 1924. But the Asante themselves had had enough of this. In 1896, when they took Prempe away, they established a system of direct military informal rule through collaborationist chiefs, people that they had appointed themselves to run the country for them. This only lasted for four years because the Asante themselves, ordinary people led by chiefs as well, fostered, created, and fought a military uprising against the British in 1900. This is commonly known as the Yasadiwako because of the heroic behavior of the Ujwesiiba, the woman Yasadiwa. That war ended in the ruthless suppression of the Asante. This time, there was no offer of perpetual peace. There was no offer of friendship. There was simply the fact that Asante was made a British crown colony in 1901, was given a British governor to rule over it in the absence of an Asante Heaney, and in the aftermath of the war, large numbers of people convicted of treason against the British crown by fighting for Asante in that war were jailed, hanged, or otherwise deported. Now, there's very little else I need to say, except that this is a shameful episode in British history, like most of British colonialism. It's a shameful episode because it was based on industrial might and a racial ideology. The British were never a great continental military power. They did not have large land armies. What they did have and what they pursued was an overseas empire from which they could extract money through trade, preferential rates, and all the rest of it. And Asante was one of the earliest additions across the world to that particular empire. It's often forgotten, and this is my final remark here, it's often forgotten how short British colonialism was. When I came to Asante, age 22, with Adu Boahen in 1968, I met people who had lived all the way through the British period. They were born before the British came, and they were there when the British left in 1957. So it is time, finally, to put this episode in the past and to reassert Asante unity under the Asante Hiri and go forward into the future. And I encourage more strongly Asante man to pursue further the matter of the restoration of the treasures that were taken in 1874 and taken in 1896. Thank you very much.
What unites a people? Is it flags? Is it army? Is it gold? Is it money? Stories, my friends. Stories. And what a story we've heard of betrayal, of courage to fight for values and principles, defeat and utter humiliation, and yet an indomitable will to bounce back and defend nationhood as sentiment and write our own true and unadulterated history. What you've just witnessed, Prof. Tom, is the Da Nsiomu dance, a very ancient and popular dance among us, the Asante, which is going ex extinct. We re reenacted today in your distinguished honor to thank you for your amazing work, which has been a labor of love for us, the Asante people, of whom you now belong to as a father and a brother. To you, we say, Yedawasia and Sada, Eja Neonia Makaski. Please, a round of applause. We proceed now in this celebration by acknowledging the causes of the war, the cause of the war, Asante Man after the war, but most importantly, the significance of what this anniversary means to our nation moving on. We're delighted to have eminent men and women who are herein gathered to lend us their thoughts on the way forward. Make welcome our moderator, who will be seated right in the middle, a son of Asante Man, who is the Ellen Garney Professor of History and of African and African American Studies at Harvard University, a proud fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a corresponding fellow of the Royal Historical Society UK, Professor Emmanuel Achampun. <laughs> Seated with him, make welcome an adjunct lecturer and gender historian affiliated to the Department of History and Political Studies at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology here in Kumasi, Professor Eugenia Anderson. In their distinguished company, from the Department of History and Political Studies at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, is Ghana's first trained social historian of medicine. Make welcome Professor Samuel Edujenfi. With joy, we receive the former research coordinator of the history and politics section of the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, Professor Samuel Intewusu. <laughs> and last but certainly not the least, our brother, our father, Professor of Asante History at the Center of West African Studies, Birmingham University, UK, Professor Tom McCaskey. <laughs> Prof. the moderator, you have an hour to deliberate. His Royal Highness, Nana Utumfo Se Tutu Abebiu, Nana Drabinghini, Chair of our Silver Jubilee Planning Committee, Nananum, Honorable Ministers and Parliamentarians, the Vice Chancellor, my academic colleagues since I'm in a university, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please allow me to stand on all previous protocols which acknowledged our present dignitaries. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, my name is Emmanuel Kwekwe Champong. Uh, I'm a professor at Harvard. I will briefly 
uh, give you the context and the format for the symposium, and then I'll sit down. So we are looking at the last quarter of a century, so from about 1874 through the Yath and War of 1900, 1901. Uh, some of my colleagues may share reflections that might go a little uh, forward than that. Uh, we have four speakers. So uh, our first speaker would be Tom McCaskey to provide a big picture. So we are uh, looking at how the Amanhene and the Amantua fared in this last quarter of the 19th century. So a big view. And then uh, Samuel Edujemfi will come after that and provide a perspective from Kumasi, a cosmopolitan city, a royal city, and the perspective on this last quarter of a century. Then we'll go to Professor Samuel Inteusu, uh, who will look at the missionary factor, both in Sagranti, going through the annexation in 1896, 1900. Uh, after all, it was the taking of the Ramses and Kune, Bonat, keeping them in Kumasi for four years that incited the sentiments that would lead or feed into Sagranti War. It is also important to note that as the 1896 expedition came, they were followed by missionaries. So it is not surprising that some of the earliest photographs we have of the submission of Prempe and his mother are from the archives of the Basel missionaries because they followed the invasion of 1896. Then we'll go to Eugenia Anderson, and I've been enjoying conversations with her these last few days. I've had the pleasure of being associated with two histories uh, by two Asante Hine. The first one by Prempe I, uh, when he was in the Seychelles, and then the present one that we will launch by Prempe II. In conversations with Eugenia, uh, she challenged me to uh, reflect on what a history of Asante could look like if dictated by an Asante Hima, and what that female perspective of Asante could look like. And I think I'll sit with that for some time to come. Each speaker will have 12 minutes for opening remarks, maximum 15 minutes. Because they are professors, they are welcome to come to the podium to share their opening reflections. I encourage them to look in my direction. So when I do this, you know you have three more minutes. And when I do this, you know you have to stop talking. And since Otufo is here, stop talking, you stop talking. <laughs> After they finish, uh, we will open up for Q&A. And I'll ask the audience uh, to ask a question. Let it be a question or a very brief comment. We are creating something called Asantipedia, which will be a popular platform online for individuals and families to deposit stories they have from their families between about 1874 and Prempe I's return in 1924. So if you have good stories, that's where it should be so that as many people as possible can ask short questions. So that's the format, and I will now invite Tom McCaskey to start us off. So let us welcome Professor Tom McCaskey. be getting tired of looking at me, I think. <laughs> but I've been called back to talk a little about what happened to Asante after the Sagranti War. After the Sagranti War, Kofi Kakari was destooled because he had presided over the humiliation of Asante. The trouble was that his successor on the Golden Stool was his brother Mensa Bonsi. Now, Mensa Bonsu was a man of avaricious, greedy, 
and vicious temperament, and is remembered as such today. He had a low, whispering voice, and if he could not hear you, or you could not hear him, he would fine you or punish you. He was that sort of person. And in the conditions that followed the Sagrenti War, he was a tyrant, and he is remembered as such. He died at, on the pra, Prasu in 1900, and his sons had him disinterred and reburied in Kumasi in 1911, and there was a huge outcry against this happening, but the British allowed it to take place. Well, going back to his reign, he thoroughly alienated almost everybody in Asante, and he began this by invading Dwabin in 1875 to, in his view, bring it to heel. The Dwabin had fled once before, but they fled this time south again to Kovaregua, the new Dwabin, and they would not return. And this opened the floodgates. Without that unity and the Asante, and Asante he knew was respected and who could impose his will and interpret custom properly, without that, all kinds of conflicts broke out in Asante. Adansi against Bikwai, Mampong against Ijueso, etc., etc., etc. And these are covered enormously in Prempe the Second's book, which you'll be very happy to hear. I'm not going to read to you. Um, and he, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And so these conflicts spread throughout its science. This water. When I was introduced, okay, sorry. it was mentioned that I had written a book on a Kumasi village between 1850 and 1950. That village is now in Kumasi, it's Adibeba, which belonged to the Manweri school. And in that book, I was able to cite testimonies of people who'd lived through the Civil War of 1883 to 1888 that were collected in the 1940s. And it was a period of intense deprivation. People starved to death. People were homeless. People were refugees. And meanwhile, the warlords, the Amenhini, who had asserted themselves against Mensa Bonsu, descended into a civil war between themselves. The country was in ruins. Kumasi, in the end of the 1880s, was in a terrible condition. An Englishman on his way to Jaman in the Ivory Coast visited it in 1889 and said it was virtually in ruins. It was nothing like it, the way it had been portrayed in the early 19th century by earlier English visitors. And so, Adjim and Prempe came to the stool in 1888 amidst these ruins. And he set about repairing the Asantiban, bringing it back together as best he could. And he had some notable successes. An expedition to Incoranza in 1892 brought the Incoranza Hini back into the fold of the Asantiban and its dependents. But of course, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Ajman Prempe could do nothing about the British. And so, while he was desperately trying to get the Asantiban reunited under its authority, the British came, as I mentioned in my first address, the British came to take him away in 1896. Now, in Prempe II's history, there is an account of the debate that he had with his chiefs about what he was going to do. And he said to them, if we fight, we will all be killed and Asante will be ruined. So I will sacrifice myself as the Asante Hiri and go as a prisoner with the British so that they will not fight here and they will not make the civil war even worse. So Prempe was taken away with his mother and his father, Kwezi Jambibi, 
off to jail in Elmina. And the Asante were not happy about this. They were very unhappy about it indeed, which is why, as I said, that war broke out in 1900, 1901, the Ya Asante Wako. Now, it is very difficult to compress and to tell you in any detail, in fact, I can't, nobody could, the events of that period between 1883, between 1875 rather, and 1900 when Prepi was taken away. They are immensely complicated, but certain things need to be noted, even if only briefly. Firstly, Prempi had some notable successes. As I said, in Nicaranza and with a number of areas around Kumasi. But he could not stem the tide of disaffection that had been caused by the real sheer anarchy of the war and the brutalities inflicted during it. Not only that, but now the British deliberately seduced dissident Asante, Asante who were against Prempe, to come south into the Gold Coast colony, as indeed the Joabin had done in 1875, and there they were given both protection and allowed to plot against the Asantehini Ajiman Prempe. Now, these are a very significant group of people, and the reason is simple. They were the people that the British relied on as collaborators once they had occupied Kumasi again in 1900 and turned it into a crown colony in 1901. And these people were placed on the stools, the senior stools, the Abrempog stools and the Amanid stools of those who had been deported ultimately to the Seychelles with Prempe. Now there's a long and complex history here. You'll be relieved. Again, I'm not going to go into it, but let me simply say this. The first 20 years of British rule are really about getting rid of these collaborators. The Asante people themselves would not put up with these people. People like Kwame Wachi and Agoda, or Kwame Tua of the Jazawa Stool, or the British informant Kwesi Apia Nuama, Kwame Tua's brother, who was made Achi Amihini by the British. They would not put up with this, and eventually, one way or another, all of these chiefs were removed. But after Premby came back in 1924, of course, the British would not in any way countenance that he become ruler again. That had to wait until 1931, when he was reinstated not as a Santihini, but as ruler of the Kumasi division, and nothing else. And it took four more years of petitioning, of trying to persuade the British to have the Confederacy restored. Now, I'm going to finish by talking about the Confederacy. The Confederacy that the British restored was restored under the precepts of British custom and British law. The principle was decentralization. They would not, for their own political reasons, accord the authority that Kumasi had enjoyed in the pre-colonial period, and they encouraged, if not secession, then forms of independent action by all these Amman. And Prampi II spent most of his long reign between 1931 and 1970, when he was not playing golf and I was carrying his clubs. He spent most of his long, long reign trying to restore the old Asante, the Asantehini's authority, the Asantehini's arbitration of custom, and these forms of traditional government back in Asante. And that struggle, I'm going to name no names, but that struggle, as you all know, everybody in this room knows, goes on to this day. I will merely mention, in conclusion, Kumasi, when I first came here, in 1968, Kumasi had 100,000 people. Now it's got four and a quarter million people. Where is the land to come from? Well, we know that right now, as I speak, 
land is the biggest issue in Kumasi. And the Asantehini has to defend the Golden Stool's rights in the land in Kumasi, which were taken away by the British and then restored only in part in the 1940s. So there are still battles to fight here, and I hope there are battles that will be won. Thank you very much. <laughs> His Royal Majesty, to four Asante Henenana, or said to two, the Vice Chancellor of KNUST, Pro Vice Chancellor, Ministers, <coughs> and all here in present, may I stand on existing protocol to proceed? I shall try to sketch my thoughts around the 18th and the 19th century Asante politics. My interest so, yeah, fundamentally would be to water. focus on Kumasi. Okay. Uh, one of okay. our sisters, okay. Edwards, who is a PhD candidate uh, from the diaspora, yes. Yes. has done something very significant. And I shall use her point yes. on the setting of Kumasi and the palace prior to 1874. The 19th century cosmopolitan city of the Asantehene in Kumasi was a well-built metropolis and economic center covering one mile not to the south and three quarters of a mile in width. The monumental Anhimfi, which is the palace of the Asantehene, was located on a hill in the city center, measuring 1,500,000 square feet and covering 34 acres. The east edge of the imperial residence was the sacred Subin River, the supreme river deities and Asantehene's place where he will worship Tridiampo. Even to the immediate west, strategically positioned throughout the lush garden landscape of the Asantehene city were elaborately Asante designed buildings and residences belonging to royal chiefs and courtiers to the king. The Asantehene city in the Edum area was not demarcated by walls like the typical imperial cities. The architecture of the noblemen's houses surrounding the residence, the dense forest, and the Subin River formed an invisible defense against invaders. European surveyors and religious and diplomatic visitors were in awe of the west of the of the vast forest landscape and the symbolic, aesthetic, and technical beauty of the structures as they entered the city. However, the position of the Asantehene city and surrounding natural and architectural elements was more than what was visible. The imperial metropolis of the Asantehene was layered with spiritual cultural and security values to the nation. Indeed, Kumase represented the traditional political capital of the forest. The forest state of Asante, as well as the residents of the Asantehene, the Oyoko royals, all important Kumase office holders and functionaries, were perform I mean, stayed there and performed services associated with the Kumasi court and their conjugal families resided in Kumasi. Again, it is significant to note that Kumasi was also the cultural capital. In this capacity, the atmosphere of Kumasi was characterized by elegance or of sophistication as initially noted. In fact, in 1874, the British led by Sir Gennett Worsley defeated Asante and ransacked Kumasi. The election of Prempe the First as Asantehene, which began 10 years after the Second War, was marked by civil war and eventual deportation and exile with key Asante leaders in 1896, first to Sierra Leone and finally to the island of May in Seychelles. British attempts to break Asante 
and impose their hegemony on Asante did not end with Prempe's exile. From 1900 to 1901, in the last Asante war of independence against the British, Asante was defeated and placed under the control of the governor of the Gokus. The British then instituted measures and institutions that started the colonization of Kumase, which they retained as the capital of Asante. May I, as a point of emphasis, say that when you look at the broader community or society of Kumase, even though we had the Asante Hene with his might and his abilities, the society was equally egalitarian so that you had members of the community from office holders to those who held no office or position. To that extent, we understand that Asante also had different people crisscrossing. In fact, Kumase historically was opened up to Hausa, Mande traders, and different people from different regions and territories prior to the 18th century and to the 19th century. Kumase remained an entrepot, so to speak, where different ideas radiated. As a matter of fact, the formation and the founding of Kumase out of Kwaman, where the Asante constitution was fully firmed up, gives us a very clear impression about the fact that the Asante Hene and Kwame Frempon Anoche, or Konfu Anoche, and the eminent chiefs who resided in their specific social and political jurisdiction agreed to that constitution which brought about an Asante Union. An idea that was alien to the European because the European assumed that the Asante Union came about only through war and assumed that the Asante Union could be compared to that, of, for example, of the European kings or monarchs who might have had their territories or spheres through dent of war. As a matter of fact, this constitution, I dare say and challenge the discussion, ran parallel to the Magna Carta. In that respect, its authority was so binding in the sacred stool, the Sikidya. That spirituality is that which was also missing in the minds of the European in many respects. Asante from Kumase was interested in diplomacy. And so before even war, there will be diplomatic engagements, there will be discussions, there will be emissaries. And this subsisted since the time of Ose Tutu the first Asante Hene. So the critical question, therefore, is to ask, why didn't the British annex Asante after 1874? Just to jump into other discussions. What had changed on the side of the British by 1800? I know that the chair is looking at me. I, I have more time. Uh, the, the 19th century began with, I mean, the reign of, I mean, Ose Tutu Kwame Isibev. And we understand that there were a lot of interesting dynamics in terms of diplomacy. In fact, his peaceful relations between uh, the British is, is well documented. In fact, Kumasi in this period received three European missions, which included individuals like William Hyde Copper in 1816. Then we have Frederick James, Thomas Edward Bowditch, William Hutchinson, and Henry Tedley in 1817 and Joseph Dupuy, Francis Collins, Benjamin Salmon, and David Mills Graves in 1820. So Kumase was the heart of diplomacy in the territory referred to as Sante and the broader enclaves that it covered. So that is just one example which suffices right. That these diplomatic missions had one goal, to negotiate for peace, to ensure that there was sometimes an uneasy truce between themselves and their neighbors, including the British. So 19th century diplomacy in Kumase took a rather different form, nature, and approach over a period of time. It was associated with a changing political scene, especially with the growing influence of Europeans at the coast. 
So diplomacy, which is effectively known in the modern sense, which requires that you have a representation in a territory negotiating for peace, among other social, economic, and political dynamics, subsisted within Asante. In fact, from about the 1760s onwards, Kumase had brought, I mean, uh, conquest, I mean, and received rent from Christiansburg Castle from the Dutch. But beyond this period, we see that the space between the 1800s, there was negotiations and also there, there, there were ideas of war and diplomacy which subsisted. And, and some of these, I mean, reports have been, I mean, perfectly written and documented by the good uh, professor of erudition, Makarski. Now, now, the peaceful relations between Asante and the British in the first two decades of the century took a different turn. What happened? Why did it take a different turn? Why would Kumase go to war? We know about Asante interest in that holding at Elmina. We also understand that the interest of the British was to ensure that Asante's control or influence, or better still hegemony, at the coastal regions will be dealt with once and for all. I mean, the question is inter interesting. Why 1874? Why post-1874? And why did the British not annex Asante in 1874? Now, if you look at the account of Ward and Kimberley and the others who have written extensively on that, including Professor Makaski himself, whom I refer to, it's, 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 it's critical to note that it was an expeditious mission. The team with Wesley arrived in the territory referred to as the colony by January, the end of January, came as far as to Asante by 31st of January. By the 5th, 6th of January, mission accomplished. They returned through Formina, where I come from, signed. I mean, the treaty was not signed. It was a treaty he would even leave because he would not sign. The, the story that I found therein has already been shared by Professor Makaski. Now, you understand that it was an expeditious mission. They returned hurriedly, and it did not suggest to us that they were there to stay. Secondly, the terms of the agreement itself, or the truth itself, or the treaty itself, also suggest a very interesting thing. Because it did not tell us that the British wanted to have an emissary or a resident commissioner in Kumasi, and for that matter, Asante. Now, this notwithstanding, I mean, you see a disputation, especially when a Dubai writes in a later period and argues that the British were interested in subverting Asante. That is why he argues that they will support Adansi breakaway, they will support the Jabin quandary, and all the other quandaries that were emerging within the state. In fact, if you, if you shift towards uh, Kimball's argument, th there is a suggestion that the, the, the British had a certain uh, vacillatory approach. They will not get into Kumase and make any intervention, but they will not also come to fight Asante even if Asante was plundering itself. In many respects, it is this civil war which persisted in Asante, plus the challenging leadership of Kakari, among other things, that will lead to the depletion of Asante's resources. Two, you would also find that with the depletion of the resources of Asante, the Asante constitution, which though held together, the social contract, which by Asante constitution allowed the state to use a subtle coercion to get members of the state to go to war had waned. Leadership challenge with Kakari, the one who followed after him, and also an internecine war, a civil war, which had eaten into the treasury of Asante. In many respects, some have argued that is what will cause Prempe the first to capitulate. In many respects, I agree in tutu with my professor with great erudition that through the tact of diplomacy, Premper I would have to save his people from war because 
post-1874 and another war just at 1896 would have been too damning and too dangerous for the health and the power of Asante, especially holding it from Kumasi. I will I try to, to just wrap up. I have one minute. One minute. <laughs> so, so, what is my last take on this within one minute? You would appreciate that by 1900, the British had come to town again. They were successful at that because the rallying call for people to come to fight did not have that kind of zest. And that is written by McCaskey. Asante will regroup, but we see that even when Asante had been defeated by 1905, Resident Commissioner Fuller had taken, had taken over, over to behave as if he was an Asante Hene. And even and when the real Asante Hene had returned, he made him Kumasi Hene, a creation by the British. The intrigues by the outsiders is what Asante has sought to cure and has found a balancing act to sustain the union till now. I rest my case. Thank you. His Royal Majesty Otunfo Osaiti II, the second. Mananom keynote speaker, Professor Thomas McCaskey. Honorable ministers, clergy, Professor Emmanuel Achampong, esteemed and distinguished scholar of Asante history, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great reverence and gratitude that uh, we gather here today to commemorate the indomitable spirit and unwavering dedication of the people of Asante who played a pivotal role during the British and Asante War of 1874, popularly referred to as the Sagrante War. As we delve into the annals of history, we also uncover stories of courage, of compassion, and sacrifice that resonate with the Asante nation. My role in this symposium is to discuss the missionary factor in the Sagranti War. Many scholars, such as Edubwahin, Tom Makaski, Emmanuel Champon, Samuel Pobi, Archbishop Sapon, Ratri, of our weeks, and many more have handled this very subject with some level of excellence. I stand on their works to discuss the interests of the Basel missionaries in the war. In the west of Njoku, the colonial enterprise and the Christian missionary enterprise together constitute two of the most important historical events that have for good or bad considerably shaped the history of Africa, including Ghana. Both defining events occurred almost simultaneously. The colonial enterprise focused on the economic and political dimensions of life in Africa, redrawing the boundaries, reshaping its political arrangements and structure, and considerably looking at different orientations and vital institutions. The missionary enterprise impacted heavily on the religious and cultural landscape of Africa and considerably tinkered with its dominant worldview and value system. A critical revisiting of these two major events, either separately or as twin events, is crucial and indeed unavoidable for our understanding of the British Ashanti War of 1874, popularly referred to as the Sagranti War. Ashanti and Britain fought several wars. Those battles were called several names, such as the Battle of Nsamankor in 1824, Akatamansu in 1826, Sagranti in 1874, and the Yar Asantua War of 1900 and 1901. 
Prior to the Sagranti War, Asante had established itself as a powerful political entity with a strong religious and cultural infrastructure. In spite of its greatness, it still fought for wars. The frequency with which Ashanti battled with her neighbors, including Dentra, Fante, Bono, Eve, Ga, Gonja, Dagomba, and many more, will have drawn attention to itself by several observers, especially the British and some missionaries. British administrators seem to have arrived at the conclusion that Asante indeed was a threat to their colonial project. Historians, Historians have, have indicated, indicated that some that of the wars that were fought between Britain and Asante were in relation to the breach of peace and agreement, and that of 1874 was not an exception. It was born out of the desire to ensure that Asante obeys the peace agreement that it has signed in 1863 not to fight the southern states and also to end enslavement of people. Achampong, Agua Wilkes, Tudor, Lewin, and several others have indicated that the Asante British War of 1874 had a kind of crushing military defeat on Asante. Asante got demoralized and of course the foundation of its very stay was shaken. Indeed, the awesome military technology of the British led that was de deployed was referred to more or less as a total war. Total war because it characterized the sound that was actually coming from the weapons and rifles that were handled by the British. But the question is that if the Sagranti War was a matter between Britain and British forces and Asante, what triggered the interest of Basel missionaries in the war, a people that were supposed to spread the gospel? To answer this question, we recast our minds to events in early 1868 and again in 1869 when the kingdom of Anglo and Aquamu around the lower Volta declared war on the Eve of Crepe. In the ensuing war, Asante soldiers sacked Crepe towns, including Sokode, Enum, Ho, and took along with them missionaries, including Ramsia and, and his people, people. Johannes, Johannes Kuhn, Kuhn, Smith, Richard, and Pam, Ramsia's maid. We might begin to wonder why an internal war could lead to the capture of missionaries. One needs to understand actions and events of this nature from the complex relationship that had developed between society, church, and the state. The Christian church in the Gold Coast at that time was lumped with other European agencies such as governments and trading firms. The church could hardly be considered by the people in the Gold Coast as an agency with a separate existence. Such was the obvious conclusion to be drawn from missionaries accompanying soldiers on their campaigns and soldiers accompanying missionaries on their mission journeys. They are perfect examples, for example, of Rhys, who was accompanied by a soldier up to a cropon from the Danish fort. There's also evidence of free men going to Kumasi accompanied by military officers. As already, already noted, noted, the first the five weeks of captivity of, of Ramsia and his group saw the captives marching at the daily pace of about 30 miles as they journeyed from Crepe towards Kumasi. This was difficult for European captives who had to walk in the scorching heat from the blazing sun and burning houses. In the process, Ramsey's baby had a fever and Kuhn a deep wound on his heel from heavy chains. Ramsey's son or child died before the captives got to Kumasi in 1870. Their hope of gaining freedom once they got into Kumasi as they expected was yet to be realized. The detention dragged on for more than four years. In captivity, Ramsey's wife gave birth to a second child. Attempts were made to release the hostages. David Asante of the Basel Mission 
His letter to the captives highlighted aspects of ransoming operations that had taken place. And I quote, twice have we sent messengers to the Ashanti camp offering money for your release, but in vain. I have been sent to Begro on the frontier of Achim to try and come into communication with you as up to the present. We have only heard of reports from you. I give the bearer a pencil, paper, and scissors that you may write or send some of your hair as an assurance that you are still alive in Kumasi. With lack of success on the part of the Basel Christian Mission, the British Colonial Administration for Gold Coast, who now had responsibility for Prepi, took charge to secure the release of the captives. One of the first decisions taken was Britain to secure, to take possession of her sentry captives on the Gold Coast, including Bofo. I have some water. Bofo's nephew, whom British officials retrieved from Krobo in 1869. The plot, it seemed, was to swap captives for the Europeans in Kumasi. Hence, in June 1870, the British governor of Cape Coast, John Popo Hensley, released and sent to Kumasi a batch of Asante prisoners seized in a previous Asante war around Achim, with a promise to free more of Asante captives upon the release of missionaries. That was also not successful. At another time, he sent Asante Hine a gold embroidered silk worth about 100 pounds. That also did not help matters. Instead, the demand was for 100 ounces of gold or about 1,440 pounds for each captive that was being held in Kumasi. To fast forward to 1872, Karkare sent the captives to Promena, south of Asante on the River Pra. And a message to the British administrator was that 1,000 should be paid to Asante agents in Cape Coast per captive so as to seal off the deal. A week later, the captives reached Formina, but before leaving Kumasi, the missionaries had redeemed their two African helpers, that is Palma and his wife, Coco, by paying six prejudices drawn on the Basel mission account. As the European captives journeyed to the coast, a British force read, headed in the opposite direction of the Asante army. The two armies clashed in 1874. The British forces seized the captives and led them as free men to Kumasi, uh, to Cape Coast. It is important to highlight at this stage that the missionary factor played a very significant role in the 1874 war. The capture of the missionaries and the ensuing negotiations allowed the British to plan both in terms of personnel and logistics to be able to launch an attack. Also, the frequent correspondences and spy work and the movement of missionaries such as David Asante enabled enough intelligence report to be gathered on Asante and his forces. Apart from this direct contribution to the war, there were equally important insights that are worthy of note as far as the involvement of missionaries is concerned. The support of missionaries for the war was simply to prov provide them with a clear form and a direct or indirect way for stability and order in the missionary enterprise in Asante. In Asante. Since the frequent wars between Asante and the people of the coast proved to be unduly disruptive and even explosive for missionary work. It became evident that after the war, some missionaries such as Ramsia had some guaranteed uh, territory for them to be able to carry out their conversion works. The interest of missionaries in the war was also due to the intimate relationship between the formal end of the transatlantic slave trade and the beginning of the Christian missionary enterprise in the Gold Coast. Even though slavery had been abolished by the British in several of their evangelisms, they had come across evidence of existence of slavery in most parts of the Gold Coast, including Asante. 
Missionaries embark on campaigns to end slavery by arguing that slaves demand mercy and compassion. In their mission to Ashanti, Saganan Wolseley and his band of fighters projected the war in such grandiloquence so as to gain some sympathy and support from missionaries within the Gold Coast and also outside of the country. These were actually people that were already exposed to a number of abolitionist proposals. Rather than trade in human beings, humanity will profit more in trading in commodities, they added. For the missionaries giving support to the war, it was more or less an obligation for them to be able to pass on Christian faith to Asante. For the missionaries, the defeat of Asante was construed and seen as a kind of remedy for the slave trade and a civilizing mission. This mindset will be put into action immediately after the war, where Basel missionaries converted ex-slaves, some of whom volunteered to be agents of the pro propagation of the Christian message and values in the dominions of Asante. The interests of missionaries could further be viewed from the perspective of so-called religious and cultural hegemony. Missionaries had a belief that people of Asante and the Gokot deserve a different doctrinal heritage, especially when Asante religion and culture was seen as an exerting overriding influence and authority over the affairs of many of the missionary operations. Asante has several deities and had no problem with bringing in more. For example, Krachidente, Nana Brukum, and several others were part of Asante uh, kingdom. Beyond their own enduring internal conversions and difficulties, the fear and even dread of Asante religious and cultural practice, religious intolerance was, in this case, a very important factor in the interest of the missionaries as far as the uh, Sagranti war is concerned. The ritual practice and the modes of worship found in the traditional religions was also assumed to be one of the critical factors that made the, missions, the missionaries to support the Sagranti war. I'm told I'm there with one minute. Oh, okay. Thank you. Now, if I have one minute, I better move maybe towards my conclusion. Now, in summary, several factors accounted for the missionary interest in the Sagranti War, apart from the capture of Ramzia. The need for space to evangelize, the fear of conversion of Asante kings and other notables into Islam, and its attendant consequences of missionary work. The need to maintain some Christian and cultural hegemony in a kingdom that was highly revered and respected among others, made the Basham missionaries to support British forces against Asante in the Sangranti War. Thank you so much for your attention. His Royal Highness, Otun for the second. Nana Nom, the Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Academics and Staff of KNUST, MPs and Ministers of State, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My dear Prof, we are an institution of learning, higher learning, and today gives us the opportunity to learn our culture at its best. Let's start it all over again with His Royal Majesty. His Royal Majesty, Nana Otun for Say to Two, the second. Nana Nom, the Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Academics and Staff of KNUST the MPs and Ministers of State, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's an honor to stand before you this morning to give... It's an honor to stand before you this morning 
to give my thoughts on war and diplomacy, especially from the perspective of women. There is an Akan proverb which says that Oba totua etrebe madem. In 1874, an Elmina born British envoy, Henry Plange, made provocative threats to the Asantehene, Kofi Kakari, and the chiefs during the discussion of the British takeover of all Dutch concessions, including the Elmina Castle. Obviously irritated by this, the Asantehima Efiakobi retorted, I am only a woman, but I would fight the governor with my left hand. These two statements mentioned above provokes an inquiry into an understanding of the place of women in Asante state military structure. How do we reconcile the Asante proverb mentioned with the above statement made by Nana Efiakobi? What specific roles did women play in the Asante military setup? In which ways did religious and cultural beliefs hinder women from full participation in state war machinery? The 18th century were times of state union, expansion, consolidation for the Asante, and a constant feature which facilitated this process was war. Asante embarked on wars for political, economic, and ideological purposes. Analyzing the etymology of Asante, linguists equate the name Asante with war. Kwejo Osei, a known historian, gives two traditions to this effect. The first states that Asante emanates from the name Esan, which simply means war. So it is, Asante 4 is the corrupted form of Esa NT4. The second tradition also states that Asante was a vassal of Dentra. And Asante used to supply Dentra with red clay, which was known as Esan, used for building of houses. The people became known as Esantefo, which was corrupted to become Asantefo. It is essential to iterate here, especially joining into the conversation of Edu, who states that war essentially elevated men over women. After the Battle of Eyase, Nana Osei Tutu the first divided the states politically into different military duties. There was the Adonten, Trafo, Benkum, Nifa, Chidom, Jase, and the Ankobia. All these positions were occupied by men. Through, though theoretically, the Ohima, that is the co-ruler of the Ohine, could serve as the head of state in the absence of the king. I am then moving on to look at women in the founding of Asante. It is important to highlight the role played by the female ancestress in the founding of Asante. The Oyoko tradition indicates that Anchewenyame and her people descended from the sky near Esiakwa in Achimebuakwa. There is also another tradition which indicates that they descended near Asante Manso. Similar traditions are given by other matric lands, including Nyankopongweshia for the Bretu, Asobode for the Asuna, Amena Jata for the Asenie and Sena Fontom for the Adriana. This explains the matrilineal system and why the genealogical descent is traced through the female line. At the core of the socio-political organization was the Abusunya, headed by the Abusunya Penyi and the Oba Penyi. The Ohini and Ohima at the highest level of state organization played complementary roles in leadership. The political status was conferred by the Ohima, who also served as the royal genealogist to determine the legitimacy of claims made to any vacant stool. And this accounts for the account proverb, Obana Owo Ohene. We are moving on then to look at women and war. Women played crucial roles in war politics in Asante. Nevertheless, their roles are largely ignored and under underrated due to Asante's religio-cultural beliefs attached to war and gender. It is important to emphasize that childbearing women did not engage in frontline warfare, not because of their physical inadequacies, but because of the fear of menstrual contamination. 
Menstruation inhibited women's political progression because of the cultural beliefs attached to it. Though menstrual blood was considered a source of fertility, menstruating women were considered ceremonially unclean. They could not attend social activities in the community, participate in religious ceremonies, honoring their ancestors, visit the chief's court, or associate with any male uh, government official. Menopausal women, however, were free from these menstrual taboos, enabling them to take part in ritual, social, and political activities. For an Asante menopausal woman, it was significant because it meant a shift from the normal life to become a respectable elder, or Baapenim. Old women acquired elderly privileges, such as the right to cut their hair, the dancing crime wear their cloth in the male fashion, drink liquor, pour libation, and engage in frontline war. Despite these limitations, women played crucial roles in war in Asante. One of the One crucial of the roles seen, seen is the ritual is the known as the Momome. This was a spiritual warfare in which premenopausal and menopausal women performed daily ritual chants ritual, dancing, mimes, and other spiritual performances to enhance the victory of the military in war until the troops returned. These women sometimes pounded empty mortars with pistols as a form of spiritual torture to Asante's enemies. Women also played female captains and the Asafu Trema, who were a type of a rear guard, they provided military support services in times such as scouts, careers, cooks, and provided war logistics. Women provided useful intelligence on strategies and troops of the enemy states. I go ahead to highlight the contribution of three Asante, Asante Hima who played very key roles in the history of As Asante. These are Efia Kobi, Yecha, and then Yasantua. Efia Kobi's skill in war and diplomacy is seen in her administrative tact, boldness, and boldness in the era of crisis in Asante. She was also known as a pacifist and a great woman of sh a great shrewdness who projected the unification of Asante above the love for war. On 20th November 1873, at the gathering of the Asante man in Shiemu, she noted to have said, from olden times, it has been seen that God fights for Asante if the war is a just one. This one is unjust. I am old now. I lived before Kwekudria, and I have, I have now placed my son on the Asante throne. I do not wish for our ancestors to say my son was the cause of the disturbance of the 60 towns. The council of the, general, the military generals superseded hers, leading to the 1874 Sagranti War with the British, in which Asante was defeated. Nana Kofi Kakari's lack of tact, acumen, and indecision eventually cost him the throne. When Efia Kobi found one of Kofi Kakari's wives wearing the gold ornament used to bury the deceased Queen Mother, she initiated his deposition, and in his place, Mensa Bonsu was appointed as the Asante Hene. So this ties in with what um, Professor Makaski said earlier, that when he was enthroned, he misused state resources. In this instance, it can be said that she sought to project her self-interest above in the choice of rulers, because for the second time, she put her own son on the throne. To secure the election of her younger son, Mensa Bonsu, as the next Asante Hene, Nane Fia Kobi forged alliances with powerful chiefs, including Bantama Hene Nane Wua II and Kokofu Hene Nana Yaobeko. Nevertheless, her own daughter, Ye Chan, overthrew and exiled her together with her son, Kakari, in 1884. Efia Kobi is remembered for her dedication to maintaining the ascension of her lineage in Asante. I move on then to look at Yaechan. 
Ye Chan became the greatest rival of Efia Kobi as she ousted her own mother in 1884. She was known to be a ruthless ruler. She secured the arrest of Kakari in 1884 and ordered his execution. Over 200 Kakari's uh, kindred were also annihilated in the process, though eventually he was spared. Unfortunately, Kwekudria II reigned for only 44 days. After his After death, death Ye Chan Ye fought Chan for the stool for her son, son. the I. Supporters of her opponent, that is Atrebuana, such as Butuakwa, Ochiame, Jobin, and Samahene, a champion, Penyin, were all execute, as executed in the process. This led to a prolonged war of four years. Within the period, she assumed the role as a rival ruler of Asante and took possession of the golden stool so that no opponent could be enthroned. In Asante norms and value systems, the accumulation of, we of wealth played a key role in power struggle. Ye Chan was a wealthy trader who used her money to finance the ambitions of her children. As a known wealthy woman, Ye Chan deployed her resources liberally. It was known that she bought loyalty using land. She also acquired a large supply of Snyder rifles and ammunition to aid her self-ambition. As, As a result, she was given the title, Oba Berima. Ye Chan remained resolutely opposed to British diplomatic missions, including Griffin, Hoxson, and Maxwell. This explains why she was targeted for exile together with Prempe the First and other prominent Asantehine, other prominent chiefs in 1896. She died in Seychelles on 2nd September 1917 at the age of 77. I move on to the last heroine in terms of Asante history, that is Yasantua. Yasantua was a formidable looking woman who had the slogan Men are not pillows for any woman to lean against. Yasantua played a pivotal role in galvanizing. <laughs> Yasantua played a pivotal role in galvanizing the Asante into action by challenging male impotency in a time of national crisis. A champion and obey emphasize that her devotion to the golden stool, determination and courage contributed to making the war against the British. When her grandson, Nana Kwesi Afrane de Dresohene, was exiled, together with Prempe the First by the British, she openly challenged the demands made by Sir Frederick Hudson for the golden stool. Her devotion for the golden stool and determination contributed to the siege and guerrilla war from April to November 1900. This contributed to her famous statement, how can a proud and brave people like the Asante sit back and look whilst the white men took away the king and the chiefs and humiliated them with a demand for the golden stool. The golden stool only means money to the white man. They have searched and dug everywhere for it. I shall not pay one prejudice to the governor. If you, the chiefs of Asante, are going to behave like cowards and not fight, you should exchange your loincloths for my undergarments. <laughs> for the sake of time, I'll move on to my conclusion. Within the broader framework of gender and power relations in Asante, women are highly recognized for their roles played in the continuity of their lineages. Because of the matrilineal structure of the Asante people, which centers on the idea that a woman passes her blood to her offsprings, this bestows on women recognized political rights. Several queen mothers did not limit their responsibilities to women and domestic affairs, but played crucial roles to enhance national sovereignty. These queen mothers highlighted defied gender stereotyping 
to shape Asante social and political ins institutions and prove the capability of women despite the religio-cultural ascribed biological limitations as compared to men. In conclusion, while women served limited roles in Asante army due to customary disqualifications and the fear of menstrual taboos, upon reaching menopause, they assumed war politics together with men. As we celebrate the 150 years since the Sagranti War occurred, it is important that we remember heroines of history, including Efia Kobi, Ya Echan, and Ya Asantua. I guess I will lastly play the devil's advocate here in probing the unsung stories of women. I wonder what the story would have been if these women had told their own stories. Had Ya Santua or Ye Chan been lettered or Western schooled, and had they similar avenues as Nana Ajimai Prempe the first while in exile, what stories would they have written about women and war? This leaves much to be desired. And I'll end by saying that as women, it bestows on us to go ahead and write our own history. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I have received royal instructions that we should end the panel discussion at 1 p.m. That's why I was sending all these uh, timekeeping instructions. So unfortunately, though I had promised Q&A, we will not be able to do Q&A. Uh, I beg uh, Tum Fu's indulgence for just two or three minutes to offer some concluding remarks uh, like academic protocol requires, and then we'll thank our panelists and close our symposium. We, we've had a wonderful uh, couple of hours, beginning with Tom McCaskey's keynotes. We've heard about the personal ambitions of individuals, someone like Garnet Wolseley, who was intent on leading the British Army, and the kinds of actions you take because of his personal ambitions. We've heard of personal predilections, the two brothers, Kofi Kakari Mensa Bonsu, and the consequences of some of these predilections. We've heard about the importance of timing. The 1870s, Sagranti, and how the outcome was almost guaranteed because of British industrial and military superiority. In a sense, it was an unfair war. The timing of the 1880s, the scramble and the petition, will make the difference between 1874, Asante is defeated but not annexed, and the insistence in the 1890s that Asante should come under British suzerainty. So timing is important. War, we've talked about two wars, Sagrenti, Yasantwa, but with very different consequences. 1874, Asante is defeated but not annexed. 1900 enabled the British to treat Asante differently from even 1896. Now Asante was a territory of conquest. We cannot talk about Asante today without Christianity, despite the rather ambivalent beginnings of Asante's relations with Christianity. Uh, I look at Kumasi today, and almost churches uh, are part of the landscape. I think St. Cyprian's is the Anglican church, right? Uh, which is also the royal church. Uh, even Ramsia has a church named after him, which is the one in the doom that my mother went to. There's Wellesley or the Methodist church uh, by the prisons. And you have to climb the hill uh, to the Roman hill to the Roman church. Uh, and it is true that the Asante have today indigenized Christianity, as Archbishop Kwesi Sapong affirms. Women are half the population, and we cannot go anywhere without our women. And I've enjoyed listening to Eugenia's reflections on three important queen mothers, Efia Kobi, Yecha, and Nandriso Hemaya Santwa. So this silver anniversary is a period of historical reflection. 
and the capacity of history to rejuvenate Asante. Titika Asun, as Dana Joabinghine reminded us, and the Asante love history. Please join me in thanking our four excellent panelists for their presentation. At this time, we'll take our seats so we can uh, go back to our seats. And then uh, uh, Mr. Jerry behind me will take over again. What shall we say to Prof. Tom McKeskey, Professor Eugenie Anderson, Professor Samuel Edujemfi, Professor Samuel Intabusu, and the masterful moderation from Professor Emmanuel Champong? Please, a resounding round of applause. We want to thank you ever so much for lending us your mental agilities and fleshing out this book from various perspectives. Let's now go back to 1874, February. Like Dr. Baumia would say, you and I were not there. <laughs> but the gods, ancestors, and spirits live in all of us. And for the next few minutes, I want you to lend your very undivided attention to the Kumasi Cultural Center as they reenact February 1874. Nananum Penny Four Machia Utun Four Santini or Tosumino Yera Nana Yamountain Quan and there, the idea you are tuned in, sir, Sagranti War. I a coach center for Enna Ebeda Sajumasui, actually, the Otroye. Your friend, Ura Emmanuel Gio Pepra Mensa. On a general mention, hey, catch you only, Madame, only a fancy and bock a cra in Shiano. All right, and thank you, Mr. Kofi Oben Onyana. And he was the stage manager for this production. And, and it, is, it is our hope that in future. Actually, this performance is two-hour performance, but for this occasion, we have abated to 25 minutes. And this production is brought to you by Kumasi Cultural Center, as he said, and made possible through the concerted efforts of some individuals, including the regional director of Kumasi Cultural Center, Mr. Peter Kofi Mafo, and Professor Daniel Dua from the International Programs Office, because this production, we need that British nationals, and we have to import some from there. So thank you, and enjoy the show. Following the Anglo War in 1826, also known as the Dodo War or Akata Council, the British and the Asante signed the Anglo-Asante Peace Treaty of 1831 at Cape Coast Castle. This treaty empowered the British 
to create the British protected territories on the lands across the river Pra. By 1872, the Danes and the Dutch had sold all their trading forts and castles to the British and left. These lands became protected from any Asante control or encroachment. The British protected territories of the southern states, Udin, Asin, Wasa, Ante, Deng, Akwamu, Ga, Adangbe, and many others supported the British, serving as their informants. As so European are on the coast, the British fomented the war against the Asantes. This is how it all began. Yura, Nancy, yes, she are. No, you didn't. Hi, Madame Roma, said you, Honoma, my own. What do you have to jam now, Menea? In Nina Dania Dani, and in T. Anna, my eating, sir. Very important. I'm not an ass, ma'am. No, it's in there. Men can't go on there. Oh, yeah, me rat. See, Sarah, when I say, I'm a rapper who trouble for Nessa. No, 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 Sabi sabi, samu, ana mumu muhina, yadi e, yabu yabula, etu uti majira ha, oke kasam, ani pshani masam, anche yabula, mura, poto, minji ni ne akwesi broi, awa uwa jambon, ah, osende amalanzo mi yogo gosi, tu mi nyuma. Et non, David, My lord, there are some chiefs here from the coastal areas and they would like to see you. What are they here for? 
they have said they want to discuss official matters with you. All right, let them come in. Wamra, Wamra. Oh, yeah, Wamra. My lord, the chiefs from the coastal areas. Tell them they're welcome. Them Ram Rad or see Ozzy or Mwakara. Yeah, bra, yeah, bra, yeah, bra. I feel so. What's your business, my friend? I'm an arokachi. So we are. Young Kutana Bonnet. What are you? Me. 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 Ye here and say, I'm an adult. Yahoo, so I didn't pat at the Maya in an animal. I want Puano. Name one, Yan Yanum Bia. One more walk as Antimem, and Jay him for Nibi. And one would be at him, Papa, at the Madi. I'm an adult woman. Yes, Renna Bru said, For the way who buy him Kuadia, Sabi, yes, you have a talent. Nadia Santa Fonim Biara, Bura, but I will be Anana and Masamami. I'm not a catch. They have been to Nadia, as we say. I asked Santa Fon, Yan and Nanum, the Ayadu, we say. Musma is a Pia, a better than the Achiram Nadu. The Nakayana and the Yaya, so we are hoping. If we say Santa Fon, you put me here. You know that just as you are so, and don't be on to it. And just say, Oh, my body, it's wrong. Yes, i my Lord, what they are saying is simply that they want to be your informant and also they will give you any secret, anything about their scientists. In return, they seek for your protection. Wonderful! Wonderful! Hello, I thank them for coming and for the information on the Ashanti King, on Akofi Kakari. Let them also know I will grant them the protection they seek for. Nanalum. I'm not Rossi or Nahumasi, Nahumaba. What's your own boy? Bobo home by Sierra, 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 Hello. We are seeking for permission to leave. Please, I thank them for coming and get them some refreshment. Yes, my lord. What's the mungo? Mungo. Grace, what do you mean? You know, by coming, what do you mean? Hey, madam. Basma. Iba, the castle, man. Iba, the pepper.
you are. And you take it. Say, and I can so simple cry, I'm on me. Zio. Cassette, your mom, so super cry and Anna. Zio. And put here, I said, and cry a more ding. Zio, I'm on my brain, say. No money, yeah. Sabi, and pay in the sea, I'm born on the Takra, and I'm in the Cassia. Zio. Men quam into me, and you're not Zio, tina mo do mo kwa me si chini nusu samumra, mo kama hong, ifi sempa nufasi abuano, opama nsa no eden wajia, enti na mama tu nsa efremo. Zio, nana nom, madam amunti ya mevu, sadi ya mevu na kakariwa si ano, osi, otu abofu, amu kompo ano, so unko si amra do nene dom, abofu ni dru ano, sabi ya mevu sabi ya nyado, akomnyampo. One two on me, not a person. I was on Sam. A quiet chair. I'm not the sad and crap. I'm a young rabble for our small more compound. And they say, Oh, my can't say you are say you are Sam Munita. You want to say, I mean, you want to say, I mean, you are a bono or the cat here and a rain and food. Yeah, we are going to go to the house. 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 We are going to go to 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 I saw the funny name to Pompa, a bubble one. I said, 
Yera Chame, Michel Abu, Madame Bantman, I'm a tossomy and sat. Mijina Ho, Madame Tia, nobody said. Nancy Yurak, a caribe, Emma, Nana Hema, nobody said something. Nana Nanomon Kaya, I will hands so NTB. Nana Nom, Crosses and Cosan, who are when you pay me, be uncle Mumada. Nancy, you're a chess, you're hanging in and say, Say, I count on ya. Yes, I want us. Nananum and Chidenti Yantraho and Chitra Santa Maya Nimunyam, a Sikadra Nimunyam, Uncle Tontini, Mansu Tananukana, Dabi, 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 Okay. <laughs> Et Jimmy Oh, here, Kumarana, enemy. So, I'm a quiet. What's it, bloody? Seven, seven, but you say, so I'll be who know, not to cheer. What's up, Metro? I'm not for talk. I'm a Kosuko, Kosum, Pamkoto, I'm a Tiago, and Pantaso. So, I'm a quiet. Matra, I'm a Santa, I'm a Kosuko, I'm almost there. They are Santa for. Officer, you. Okwa wea wea fe bo so me se kaka me kan se bira wada roma so obama me kwa aka me bati bro ni koko atwaniti ada bati na asante ma sam na no aka no che 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 ye wea chia me tie we bro wada ma tie ma ne tu ye wea ene na hima se na da ma wo se bi mpeni se abwa tetia wo hui Yenya bute jana yehuno nisuno. Sedi ya swa semi ekui na dama enki yensi ya bute. Ah! Na yangu ni yehuno se apuma ni simetu. Tanya sa sedi apeja semi de. Yedi mowe ne kura ebetu ya. Tuna dama yensi ya bute. Kaza chile. Kwa kasi bonyo dunia semi medu ya sabi yangu asemu puma sibre na dama. Tena si tena si. So when you hear Catrasi, who fool? Ira Chami, Adama, Afo, Berima, for Ekasi, Adama, and Tumira, and to Nahi Mamami. Men and Anna Wedi Kakasa, you know, again. What you go home? The whole bone. No, quite semi. Which are which are all yen in a scadental and wet young penny and penny. I don't see the edge. No bedra. No cost semini. The man who say, Say, get away. If you trap in a son, one meme. A shame, Mira. My grandfather's my first man crying. I'm going. Mira, 
decide to resist Esa. 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 was the only kingdom that prevented them taking their land. Then, then the blue moon. moon. And then at arrived in the Asante Empire. But 25,000 troops and thousands West Indian and African troops in Jesus. Including then. Kumasi was abandoned by the Asantes when the British arrived. Kumasi was demolished by the British with explosives. Hmm. <coughs> the 
harm has already been caused. And it's the only time you can wipe off memory of this invasion. The British took away cherished treasures, including rows of books, and as well as the headgear of Nana Kofi Kakeri, except the golden stool. Mr. Esikeja. The harm has been caused. And it is only time that can wipe off memory. How can we forget the death of our war general, Nana Mankwetia, and some notable chiefs in the hands of the British? How can we forget the death of thousands of people, thousands of those left behind? How can we forget the things that rage profusely on that faithful day? How can we forget the treasures that were looted away? <clears throat> but through the passage of time, now Kumasi owed several British citizens and London houses several Asante. The city said Ghana started to destroy the repository of Ghana's culture and the of British nationals quite ironically tore in it every year to see the very thing they seek to destroy or carry it away. The British brought their cannon to the bush but the bush was stronger than the cannon. Asante was born in battle. Nurtured in battle and sustained in battle. Today, as a proud kingdom, we learn from our defeat and also celebrate our victories. It's what will forever make the Asante kingdom powerful and mightier. Long live the king of the Asantes, His Royal Majesty Otufo Osei Long live the kingdom of Asante. Asante. Naturally, this should exude an ovation. I don't have to ask for it. The Kumase Cultural Center, let's appreciate their effort, their brilliance in reenacting this great war, the Sagranti War. And now, remaining standing, 
Your Lordship the Chair, Your Royal Majesty, humbly I ask that together let us pay tribute to all our men and women who lost their lives in this great war. For they are a part of an unbroken line of heroes who have borne the heaviest burden of the freedoms we enjoy today. A minute's silence. It's our prayer that the blood, sweat, tears, and toil of our heroes past shall never be in vain, that their souls rest in glory. Amen. Amen. A resounding round of applause to celebrate. Where come from? We're joined today by the Amwafuman Hima, the queen of the area where this great battle was fought, Nanekia Efriye III. She joins us with good news. This reenactment that you've seen has been put together by way of a very well-curated exhibition depicting the war, and it's on display at the battleground at Amamfu. We ask that you all make your way there at your convenience together with your families as we relive this experience. A round of applause for them too. <laughs> to launch this book is a man who is in the battle of his life as significant as the Sagrenti War. His is to bequeath for this generation and generations yet unborn an education and an educational system that is functional and fit for purpose. Or Santi, we know he will win. I give to you the MP for Busumchi, a proud native of Jache, and Ghana's Minister for Education, Dr. Yao Osei Educhum. Royal Majesty Otunfo Osei Tutu II, Chairman of this occasion, immediate past Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, Chairman of the Planning Committee, Nana Otio Srebo II, Nananum Amaihne, Nananum Vice Chancellor of the University, uh, KNUST, Regional Minister, Mayor of Kumasi, 
members of parliament, my colleague, uh, Minister Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor to have been asked to launch this book. Your Royal Majesty, the last time I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you, I went home and told my mom that I met the king of Ashanti. Then she started jubilating. <laughs> Yay, me back, as you are for. So if my mom was alive today, I think if she was to see me on TV, she would say, hey, and then the autumn for book now na okay down a day. She would have said, today my son is launching a book written by autumn for Osajman Prempe II. It's a very great day. Uh, for me, the MC mentioned I'm fighting the another sagranti war to bring about uh, uh, education transformation of our nation. Maybe not exactly sagranti war, <laughs> but what we seek to do is to ensure that we transformed the education system of this nation to ensure we transform the socioeconomic institutions of our nation. This is a very fat book, even for education minister to read. So I went through some pages, and um, very exciting. In fact, once you start reading, you can't stop. It's filling in the gaps for us, even for those of us who have studied history. All the things that you thought you knew, you're going to find the gaps filled for you. The book is a concise autobiography of the author, Otunfo Selsajima Prempe II, the 14th Asantehine, overseeing an illustrious research committee of nine, which included the likes of Berima Kojo Ousuyansa, CEO of Sei, JWK Apia, IK Ajimai, Ohineba Boache Dankwa, Achempemhine, Edward Owen, George Asafu Eje, and Chiamen Bafo Akuto. The work started in 1939, unless Atai Yachematin, another local intellectual, was later added to the research team to prepare the script between 1944 and 1946. It will take a little more than half a century on the hard work and dedication of notable historians like Professor Edubuahim, Professor Emmanuel Champon, and Professor Makiski, coupled with the ardent support of Otunfo Pokwai II and Otunfo Setu II to discover and compile the original writings and typescripts for finally producing the history of Ashanti. Otunfo Sajima Prempe II gives an account of the events preceding his birth when a leopard appeared in Kumase three days before he was born, this earned him the name Kwame Chuchi. His other names were Ose Kwame, Ose Tutu, Ousu, as he was known after his baptism into the Wesleyan Methodist Church in 1911. He was called Edward Prempe Ousu. This publication of the history of Ashanti transcends this famous Asante saying, the truth is now known to us all. As the first most educated Asante, he placed much emphasis on education as the bedrock to national development and advancement. As a young adolescent, Osir Kwame came to realize that literacy and numeracy furnished by the Western education were indispensable keys to survival and future prosperity. This was before the sustainable development Goals Declaration by the United Nations. He was a founding member of the ACUS, the Asante Kotoko Union Society, whose objects were about moral, civic, and economic improvement within an Asante nationalist framework. Tunfo gives an account of Asante origins and connections with the biblical 12 tribes of Jacob and their subsequent migration 
through the Middle East to the present habitation in Asantima. Readers are also given extensive details of the reigns of the previous 13 Asante kings from Otu Fawcett to the first to Otu Fawcett Prempe the first, and he concludes with a brief note of his reign and the restoration of the Asante Confederacy on 31st January 1935, when he, when he proclaimed to Asante man that unity is strength. There have been many writings about Ashanti history, but the history of Ashanti by Utun Fosse Ose Ajima Prempe II is the most comprehensive and definitive history of the Ashanti kings, the people of Ashanti Mai, and their dealings with their neighbors in pre colonial Gold Coast and European colonialists. Students of literature, history, and the arts will find in the history of Ashanti a wealth of material to enrich their knowledge. It will also stimulate research to add, to add, to enrich this volume. It is a must read for all and sundry, and should find its way into every house, library, educational institutions, and bookstores. The two four say, Ose Ajima Prempe II, consider this publication his greatest wish, and is now displayed before us to get hold. All of us should endeavor to get hold of a copy of this book. See, I was, as I was reading and going through pages by a sheer act of serendipity, I opened page 181. And here it was, story. And the story reads, talks about Edua Wabeng. He was a member of the senior family, and he went to report to Akuse Yano Amekomhine that he was of the same family as he was and that he had removed himself from his original town to settle at Odahun. Akuse Yadom accepted him warmly as a relative and lived happily with him. Edu Yabua Krenchi used to visit Odahun and then return happily to Amekum. He was a medical man and possessed many efficacious medicines. He was referred to as Edua Wabin, who lived at Odahun. This was the reason that there is now a town called Eduaben. My grandparents are from Eduaben. And from there, they moved to Jati. So today, I was reading the book. I come to know more about why the town is called Eduyame. The pages of this week may also read something about your family, about your inheritance, about hope, about aspirations, about loyalty and commitment to a cause, a cause bigger than yourself, about patriotism, individuals who are willing to even pay the ultimate price so that their kingdom will survive. This is a book which is a must read. It teaches us many lessons as to how you even die for your kingdom, as to how you dedicate yourself to making your kingdom better than you came to find it. There are men and women who have done so many things. I saw stories of commitment stories of promises made and promises kept to the extent that a woman who asks that when she passes on, her name should be re remembered after she had given up her son. The Otunfo then made a commitment to her, and consequently, Otunfo and the subsequent Otunfos named their children after this woman, promises made promises kept. Here is the story of a kingdom, a kingdom that has stood the test of time, a kingdom that has contributed so much, so much to humanity, a kingdom that we have to learn from in order to create a better world, a better nation. Two, four, three, two, two, the second. 
Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to do this luncheon. And I, it is my prayer that all of us will pick copies of this book. It's also my prayer that other authors of children's books will begin to take this book and write children's versions of it so that our children will begin to know more about this great kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yao Osayedu Chum, respectfully, I'll have to invite you back to do a remedial. This is where you officially declare this historic book duly launched. Please, a round of applause for him. <laughs> O two for your royal majesty, the king, I, with your permission, I declare the book, History of Ashanti, by O two for Nana Osei Ajima Prempe II, duly launched. And so the Honorable Minister will present the first copy to His Royal Majesty Utunfo Osei Tutu, the second, Asante Hene. A round of applause. <laughs> wow. Thank you for launching this great book for us. Time is fast spent, and so we shall move straight into the auction. It is my pleasure to invite, to assist me, my very own sister from Oirepa TV, make welcome Ekia Esiedua. What we want to do for the next 15 minutes is a very simple exercise. We have a total of 150 books. 30 have been signed, I mean personally signed by His Royal Majesty Utum Fosei Tutu II. We want those 30 to be out of here in five minutes. We want somebody who is touched to make us an offer. We have a few offers but allow me to just share with you, and if you're moved to do beyond that, Otunfo will be pleased. We acknowledge with gratitude the contribution of Nana, Dr. Nana KJC, who has given 100,000 Ghana cities toward the symposium and the book. A round of applause for him. But if you think that is too big, then wait till you hear from Simain Construction Limited who say, touched by this great work, they are giving 150,000 Ghana cities. <laughs> and so it's official, we have 23 left for grabs, personally signed by His Royal Majesty or two, four, or say to two, the second. If you are one of the five people who want to get this at a very good offer, I will give you a certificate. I will give you four tickets per person to attend Otunfo's birthday dinner. It's a good deal. Yourself and four additional people. Who is making me an offer? We have 100, we have 150. Anybody making an offer? Today we want to discourage pledges, no pledges. We insist on checks and cash. 
and transfers. And so we have account details to spell out also. And so, in the footsteps of his grandfather, the MP for Minsia South, Ghana's Minister for Energy, is doubling all of this 200,000 Ghana cities. A copy of the book for him, a certificate, and four tickets. Otun fo o sei tutu a wo tosu mi no crop ye yi fi asante kotoko hene wa ma hene ye akono dodo o hene mi sreu ni die kasa ewie yi nananom o man aso afo mrahye bedwafo aban akra chimpanimfo e ma ne me ma mo wa ha ene mi nuanom nyina ye hia ene mi ji di se ene e ya bakosam e ma ye nso e wo ye bre yi so na ensem ni nyina nananom di kan aka dada me be gi sika wo mo ho nti me be ka ye kasa no na matimi agye madan ka ni ye ye hia se asanteman ye hia se asantefo na ye kasa no ya ya nkomu a na ko ye se bibi e ya ka chiri kakra me nua be ma jerry aye edwuma ni bebre no na me me dia ka me de be ka ho no e ye adeton no minister adabuku na di amade edi nkan ne yato ya chiri chiri na nhihye ye wo ho kakra ne ye wo ho no ne se um, ni aya to talk copies ni bi be ya uh, 150,000 ni de e kono e no ni wo ho me nso me dia me de ba no me de ba abuo fo se de nana no me wa ha eni mpanyi nyina nso obi a betimi ato bi wo to a wo to ma wo ho wo to a wo to akoto ahinfie wo to a wo to ma wo ma o ma nana nom eni da chi wo ni ho kra ye ma wo ma ne so a na e kan ba kosem e de akyere Ain't you know? Um, young me and she a kind and eh, and young quiet dear and a yes, yeah, junior she a kind. Said ye a bacosum and yera now and penis a sabbe, eh, oh, for an attack a man prani free tears of forno. A queer queen, a sea in fear or honey a drum, one hundred and fifty years, and so eh, ye come one some nina a bacosum nibia. Ye a creature go on, mummy and pebbing coffee, why? Na yes, sir, and anonym, and you be a waha, yes, sir, when you are near, dear, bed you copy, na young quay and name. Ye be a dear ba, I be shabu to be an answer, Emma, dear, a yet dear, oh, oh, charm and a balo, Emma. Why, here is an hour, may say dinner, no. Me, me, dinner, me, person, me, co, who be internet, me, 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 Enyum kete fuo ana adwa kete mesemo mhm mo fa bibi emaye na yanhwe ekwan ya yebetimi ede afaso ye wo ngoma no be ye duasa wa ha a ye beton ansa na ye fiha and so we have two more contributions coming through from Dr Ernest Ofori Sapongo specialized he gives 100000 Ghana CDs and you know that he's not alone because his brother, Ose Kwame Despite, also joins with 100,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. We want to come down to the level of everybody, and so we ask that 50,000 and above. 50,000 and above. Your bank for life, GCB, 70 years of unparalleled banking solutions to Ghana, 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. And they will have a certificate. They will have tickets to attend the two fours birthday dinner.
UniJ Fashion 100,000 CDs and Isaac Books 150,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them too. Your Royal Majesty Otunfo, your loyal subjects, 1990. 1990 are giving 100,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them. Newmont, Africa. 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause for them. Cow Bank, 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. Corporate organization Samoa ha individual Samoa ha ankran kre eni nyume kuo muti meba na muamu be tu mudi eni di na enu echi no mu kwa na de ya autography ne kama no ya ibi edi amamu na chesa mudi akoto ho aye abako sem edi ama enchima ya ka unsu ti mi don sesi ukoko na wa kambi na ukobi na wa anye bidia eni ena chesa no kwa na wa ankran kre ye enti mumra mumtu ya chema mu mumra 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 who the bar say a year transfer and I be a year budget, a year cash, a year budget, a year check and swap, and also a year budget. Yeah, try money now, see ya. Nana, no, I'm paying for my brothers and sisters, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We want to make this very simple. If you have an offer, please proceed. We will allow you to make the offer known to the king in your own words, and then you proceed. You take the book and take a bow in front of the king. Is that agreeable? Okay. So Fidelity Bank is joining us with 50,000 Ghana CDs. Nana Bantma Hene, Nana Makutia joins us with 50,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause. The regional minister, the Honorable Simon Osei Mensa, joins us also with 50,000 Ghana cities. <laughs> MP for Tanon North and Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources, the Honorable Dr. Frida Prempe, 50,000 Ghana cities. <laughs> Dr. Fred. Che Asamoah, the CEO of Codvet and the parliamentary candidate for Ofenso, joins us with 50,000 Ghana cities. Fidelity Bank, Fidelity Bank Ghana, 50,000 cities. By the kind permission of His Lordship, the Chair, we come down to 20,000 cities and above. 20,000 cities and above. 20,000 cities and above. He did not only launch the book, he came with a very handsome offer of 100,000 Ghana cities. Ghana's Minister for Education, the Honorable Dr. 
Yao Osei Edujun. Please, a round of applause. Thomas Boesi Sapong, executive head at Cal Bank, 20,000 Ghana CDs. We say thank you. The Glyco Group. The Glyco Group and the Champonche family join us with 20,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them too. Nana Mansun Kwantahine joins us with 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. <laughs> the mayor of Kumasi, the Honorable Sampine, 20,000 Ghana cities. Mr. Isaac Komi, the Deputy CEO of the Architectural and Engineering Services Limited, joins us on behalf of his organization with 20,000 Ghana cities. We thank you ever so much. It gets better because Otum Force and Koswahine joins us with 4,000 US dollars. What's the same? The Zongo Nkoswahine joins us with 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. <laughs> Ambassador Edward Boating joins us with 20,000 Ghana cities. And our very own voice of God in the city of Kumasi, Pastor Ransford Obeying of CCC. 20,000 Ghana cities. In the spirit of inclusion, we come down to 10,000 cities and above. 10,000 cities and above. Koa Research and Manufacturing Company Limited, Kumasi Brand, 10,000 Ghana cities. Nana Domi Abrahini joins us with 30,000 Ghana cities. Mpacho Mpacho Yembo Nsimane. Dr. 
Dr. Kweku Ote, Angel Group, 100,000 CDs. Dr. Kweku Ote, Angel Group, 100,000 CDs. Republic Bank joins us with 10,000 Ghana CDs. And so does Sonia Rotterman also join us with 10,000 Ghana CDs. Nana no me pamocho. Nana Jamana can tell our tossumi no offense my hene. Thirty thousand cities. Nana Jamana can tell our tossumi no offense my hene. Thirty thousand cities. ANC, Dr. Andy Asamoa, 50,000 Ghana cities. A round of applause. Mepamocho Nana no misemunini de kasaka kra. Mepamocho obia o waha wetiano. Ya paucho ya na wako pone ho ewa min sabin kumso. Na ya tru di na yetimia do telephone number na che yetimia follow up na ya shishao. Me pamocho sadia u certificate no un sabe timiaka. Ene no me wonhu a wasi ya de maono. Na un sa etumi aka ntime pamcho ya mon shanen so. Obi a wa ebia wetu yesika. Ah, yen tru udino, Mr. Copone woman, Sabin Kum Sontenten, Soho, Oka Betru Udin, na u certificate in so, ya de amount. De kita me free, a kenten appear me can university, Professor F. K. Safu, a honor or war, Professor Safu so by any dear woman, ten thousand cities. A kenten appear me can university, Amstead, Professor Safu, ten thousand cities. From the Ghana Communication Technology University, the Vice Chancellor, who is the Fiapre Hene, Professor Emmanuel Ohene Afuakwa, 10,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them. From the SRC Secretariat of the KNUST, 10,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them, too. School for Nayadie. Me pamocho mi jina hama nana buachi an sandebra asokore mampo hine nana buachi an sandebra ten thousand cities nana buachi an sandebra asokore mampo hine ten thousand cities.
And so for what it's worth, the leadership of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is committing 50,000 Ghana cities for five books to be put in their libraries. A round of applause for the KNUST. Yeah, Pamocho, and Kaibowe, a Koma Yenina, Moma Yentiana Yenshan, and Sonananum, Mada Roma, a Hokeka, Mode Asso, Sa, a Gume Mono, a Broyer, so Nananum say and Kanchamo say, Se Usikane Waha, na Upeso Utia, ye beggy, Naya Tru Dina to Ho, Na Yamea Domna say ye free ha, Econo, dear Ubertoni Gassono, a free thousand, a cosy five thousand. Every thousand, it could see five thousand, and no dear cotton or hine own autography mount. Three thousand, it could see five thousand, and no, and no, the Oberto book who saw now what was signed within womb, now they are two library. Ah, and no, dear Santa, and they sign it in the signature womb, a more date, my own, they are one other sign, what they are, now they are two library. Never would see every five thousand, and corner they are cotton or hine signature, beba or library, and unty motion and sosa, and my damasin. Such overwhelming love for Asante Man. And it's all because of leadership. Leadership that inspires and galvanizes a nation into action and endeavor. We salute you, Your Royal Majesty Utumfo Osetu II, Asante Hene. In a short while, we shall bring this exercise to a close. We shall hear from our chairperson, and then we'll be out of here. Nana no me pamochom say jina hebiu. Nana so kore man po hine nana wachi an san debra ne dia ten thousand no. What the ten thousand I come home. I'm anaya twenty thousand. Pamochom mama mo nse mana na. Mama mo nse mana na. Or the kind of ten thousand by what the ten thousand I come home. I'm anaya twenty thousand. E damase. Ventures, K and to love ventures. Was a mecca alias Foka, more money no mobile honor. One also deal with ten thousand, ten thousand in our day. K and to love ventures, alias Foka, Madame Mosse. Okofu kwabna bonsu dompa sehne okofu kwabna bonsu 5000 
Professor Gabriel Jumo, Vice Chancellor of Kwanzaa Unified University, 5000. Professor Gabriel Jumo. Professor Gabriel Jumo. Professor Gabriel Jomo, VC, Kumasi Technical University, 5,000 cities. Professor Gabriel Jomo, Vice Chancellor, Kumasi Technical University, 5,000 cities. Yeah, the prophecy. Otunfo Sasan Mohine, Penny, 10,000 Ghana cities. Nana, yeah, that was super. And so soon we shall bring this to a close. I ask that we wrap up. In two minutes we wrap up. Bafo Kofi Atobra the second Dadia Suoma Hine Dadia Suaba Hine joins us with 10,000 Ghana cities. Nana, that's it. Another one about, another one about. Okay. Me pa mo cho, me jina hama, nana kwa mo hini. Nana ousu nyeni, nana ousu nyeni, 5,000 cities. Nana kwa mo hini, nana ousu nyeni, 5,000 cities. Nana no me yada mo se, yada mo se pa. Me pa mo cho, me kai mo se obi a wetu e usika book no o nsanka wo de no sika a wetu a no e na be kyerɛ se otumfo santehene e be autography ama wana ye ye ni nyina wi a ya gye mu details ni ntia be wi mo kyerɛ kwan na ye de obi a de abrɛ ne pepepe ti me se wetu e sika no na se book no o nsanka ya ya na wanya ye ho abotrɛ ye de bebrɔ ye da mase to this end, I ask that we all put our hands together for the contributors. And I ask also that we all take our seats. Mipacho Bian Tnasi. All our members at the table, I ask that we all take your seats. At the end of this event, we have more books coming through. The table will still be open for more orders. Me pacho yeng na We are just about wrapping up. Please be seated. Me pacho biant na se. Yada moase.
Mais pas trop bien, tu n'as cité beau fois, mais pas trop. Let's seize all activity at the table, please. I ask that we all take our seats. The table will be reopened at the end of the event, please. Mais pas trop, let's all be seated. Okay, I ask that we all be seated. Me pacho bien tnasi. Me pacho bien tnasi. Me fa e juma number wi ye. Ye wi so a. Ye be be table ne bi o. Cashiers at the table, please cease operation, please. Let's honor our king, please. Me pacho activity be a table nun jai si siya ya pacho. Me pacho be an tina si ya da mosi. Me pacho be an tina si, o be an tina si, o be an tina si. Ye wia ya be bubo contributions no, but si siya di o be an tina si. Yeah, that must be. It's time to hear from our chairperson for the occasion. However, allow me to acknowledge the contributions of Adansihene Nana Bonsra Efriye II for his generous contribution of 10,000 Ghana CDs. In the same vein, the Sumoja Hene Odinehun Ochre Kusi Ntrakwa also joins us with 20,000 Ghana CDs. Joseph Construction have been generous today and they've given 50,000 Ghana CDs. A round of applause for them all. Nana Ahinkro Oseipoku. Asante Ahinkro Hene. Nana Ahinkro Oseipoku. 10,000 CDs. Saranso Ena Yenyankra Edia Free Nana Tepamai Hene Soho. And also at the 10,000 cities, and at the Ebuanana Edu actually one pim, Tepamine, 10,000 cities. Yeah, that was it. Nana Denta Sehima Nana Denta Sehima, five thousand cities. Nana Himaya, dear Mumay and Nana, see a point, say, man. Nana Amo Enne or Hinim or Hima, five thousand cities. Nana Ammo and Nehima, five thousand cities. Nana Ammoafo Hima, and join Nana Ammoafo or him, and on him. Okay, okay. The Quamafo, the Quamafo. 
Nana be kwa ya muafu hene, ene ne hima 5,000 cities. Nana be kwa ya muafu hene, ene ne hima 5,000 cities. Nana be kwa ya hene, 5,000 cities. Nana be kwa ya hene, 5,000 cities. Nana e jesu hima, ene e jesu hene, 5,000 cities. Nana jesu hima, ene e jesu hene, 5,000 cities. Ya danana no maase papa ape. Ya danana maase papa ape. Ya danana maase papa ape. Okay. Nana denya se hema. Nana denya se hema. And so 5,000 cities. Ya da nana ma hema ene ahini nina se. Achamfo, asafo, buache, ajiman bonsu. 20,000 Ghana cities. Asafo hene ya da wase. Sasuna mahama ba. Enya kufwa do ba. Yena yen kwabna nyame, aka Apia Stadium. Why is ten thousand Ghana cities? Why you nigga na? Yo, aye aye aye. Hey, hmm, Apia. Yo, shortly we hear from our chairperson. We pass away hanging di, hanging di. Happy a stadium. Why you be here? Get us it. Get us it. Get us it. Aye, aye. Pass away behind us it. Oh, behind us it. Pass away. Me pass away. Any day, moa. Yes, sir. My dad. We shall now hear from the chairperson for this auspicious occasion. I ask that we receive with joy his lordship, Justice Kwesi Enin Yeboa. His Royal Majesty O2 for Dasantihine, the Chairman of the Planning Committee, Nana Otio Sribo II, distinguished guests, please for <clears throat> the fact that we are far behind time, may I respectfully plead that I stand on the existing protocol. My duty at this time is to make some remarks about what the contributors offered us in course of the symposium. Starting with Professor Makaski, I must confess that this is the first time I have met somebody outside the jurisdiction who appeared to have unearthed everything about the Ashanti history. Prof, we are very, very indebted for your invaluable contribution. Yes. In fact, you went to town. The, you got to tell us how the war started, how it ended, and the aftermath of the war. And the fact that they came purposely, some came, especially Sir Garnet Wesley, he came to just to enhance his ambition to become the commander of the British Army or whatever. And under the guise of spoils of war, everything that they found was looted. And you even suggested that the Ashanti should take the immediate steps to seek for the return of some of these uh, gold ornaments which are still in the uh, British museums as exhibits taken from the shores of uh, Ghana. Then we came to Professor Edu Jemfi. He limited himself to the uh, 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 Kumasi as it then was at the time of the war and that, according to him, the, it was an egalitarian sort of society. And after the deportation of Prempe the I, the Ashantis ha had to come to terms with the situation. And that there is a clear misconception on the part of the authors of the Ashanti history in Europe who thought that the Ashanti empire spread through conquest. And I will make it, you made it clear 
that they adopted the constitution to uh, make the Ashanti nation a confederacy of some sort. And I think uh, all of us drew lessons from it because personally I was under the misconception that indeed uh, it was through conquest that the empire uh, spread. Now we, we have to acknowledge your contribution to uh, this area of uh, the history which has never come to the fore. And you also talk of diplomacy, which uh, prevented the, sorry, which uh, promoted the growth of the Ashantis in the 19th century. Then came the Sagranti War, and uh, according to you, it was just an expeditionary force because they did not come to uh, stay in Kumasi or any part of the Ashanti region. And after the war, they just entered into the treaty and then left till they came back in 1896 to uh, take Otunfo, uh, uh, Prempe the first away to Seychelles. Yes. We are also acknowledging what the third speaker, Professor Nteusu, also discussed. He came to let us know about the role the missionaries played in the conquest of Ashanti, and that the missionaries were, some of, as he said, some of them were indeed spies for the British Empire. And that when they captured some of them and brought them to Kumasi in captivity, yes, they were there for some time and there were negotiations for them to be released to uh, also get the Ashanti captives in the coast also released to the Ashantis. And he did mention the name of Ramsia which name still resonates in the ears of every Ashanti, especially those in the Presbyterian mi mission. Yes. Then he also came to the fact that uh, after that, the war against the Ashantis became easier because the missionaries themselves uh, were aligned to the uh, British uh, forces to get access to the information with which they can come to have an easy task of destroying the Ashanti Empire. We are also heavily indebted to the last speaker, Eugenia Anderson. She dwelt on the specific roles of women in the Ashanti Kingdom. And she went forward to mention the three famous names, and I will come down to it. He, he started to trace the succession in the Ashanti Kingdom through females, and that he said that even in war time, they also have specific roles to play, but they have not been acknowledged by the writers. And she is a historian, and I think she has done an in-depth uh, research and has come to recognize that they, some of them stayed behind. Some of them were also at the forefront carrying ammunition and the rest to uh, provide support services for the military. And he also uh, did say something about the fact that those uh, women when uh, at that time were in their menstrual periods, they were seen as a taboo, especially uh, in performance of certain traditional duties, and that those who had passed the men who, were men who had the their menopause were playing active roles and could perform several services which the others had been denied. Indeed, he mentioned the name of Ya, ya Cha as the greatest, uh, one of the greatest queen mothers of the Ashanti kingdom, and then um, Ya Santiwa and Efuya Kubi as a renowned chief, uh, queen mothers of the Ashanti. And indeed, she quoted is, uh, what Ya Santiwa said, that men are not pillows for anybody to lean against. And uh, that it was Yasatiwa whose allegiance to the Golden Stool marshaled all the forces. And for the first time in the history of Ashanti, the expedition to go and fight the British was led by her. And uh, with that, we've come to the end of it. I think we have, uh, we've learned so much from all the uh, various speakers and some of us
are better off. Indeed, we, we, we've been scratching history till today that we've been taught how everything started and ended, and that all of them concluded that af af after the war, Ashantis came back to get united, and now we are seeing that the time has come for us to have this 150th anniversary as a remembrance day to commemorate whatever went wrong in the history of Ashantis. With that, I take this opportunity to thank the various speakers for what you've done. And uh, on behalf of myself, the O2 for the planning committee, yes, we are very, very grateful to you. We are heavily indebted for your contribution to the Ashanti history. And posterity will certainly reward you. Thank you very much for this. His Lordship, Justice Kwesi Eninyabua, immediate past Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana. Please help me thank him. We thank you, Your Lordship, the Chair, for chairing this auspicious occasion for us. In bringing this celebration to a close, it will be remiss of me not to acknowledge the untiring efforts of a woman, two women as a matter of fact, the first happens to be the first university graduate from her village, Asante Achim Domiabra. It has pleased God that today, her efforts as the publisher of this book gets the attention of His Majesty the King. Make welcome Madame Akos Ofuri Mensa, the CEO of Sub-Saharan Publishers. Mami, I invite you to take a bow before the king. Please, a round of applause. She's accompanied by Osem Mensa Michael, the elected president of the Ghanaian community in France, and together with the head of their family, they make a contribution of 5,000 CDs in spite of being the publishers. Please, a round of applause. And all this history has been passed down because our mothers kept the oral tradition. I'm delighted to present to you, Your Majesty, a woman who placed second in the regional contest on a sentiment history in the high schools back in 2003. Today, she serves as the coordinator for the Nalep, but from Tafopan Krono with pride. Make welcome Dr. Sewa Donko Louisa. A round of applause for her. <laughs> Doc, where are you? She's hidden somewhere. Okay. And so shortly we shall bring this celebration to a close. To say thank you is a man who is grateful for the gift of today because in his lifetime, he has seen honor bestowed to his beloved father. Make welcome a son of the Asante Hene, Otun Fos Akonfre Hene, Nana Akwesi Abeye. Your Majesty, Eja Utun for Osei Tutu the Second, Asantehene, in whom I'm well pleased. Dasibre Utio Sibo the Second, Nana Jabinghene, and Chairman of the Planning Committee.
my Lord Chief Justice, I continue to call you Chief Justice because once a Chief Justice, you're always a Chief Justice. My Lord Chief Justice, Enin Yeboah. The Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor, Regional Minister, Professor Tom Makaski, Professor Champon, and the rest of the panel. Nananum, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me as a son of Utum Force outside my Prebbe II to be given the honor to give the vote of thanks for such an auspicious occasion. But fortunately for me, the Lord Chief Justice has done my work for me by literally summing up what each one of the panelists said. So I sat down quietly and said, what then should I do? And I said, ah, throughout the soul of this morning, not many people will go away knowing who my father, Otu Force Elside my Prempe was. So the question is, who was Otu Force Elside my Prempe? Who was he? He was the 14th Asantehine. He was born in 1892, four years before his uncle, Nana, Sel, Nana Ajiban Prempe I, was exiled to the Seychelles Island. Therefore, he could not have known or seen much of his uncle before he was exiled. But amazingly, amazingly, the numbers 39 and 78 form a greater part of his life. At the age of 39, he became a Santini in 1931. 39 years later, he died as a Santini at the age of 78. Now, we are told in this book that the book started in 1939 and got completed around about 1946, which means Today we are in 2024, from 1946, exactly 78 years. So 39 years before he became king, 39 years on the stool, he died. It's taking 78 years for a book that he published, that he wrote or, 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 or supervised to be published. Those of us who were privileged to be his children, and he had 21 of us, 11 male and 10 female. By the time of his death, each one of us was alive. Each one of his 21 children was alive by the time he died. Now, as I speak to you, we have become an endangered species <laughs> with only four male and three male, three female survivors. His predecessors, as history has told us, went to war. Asante being in the center of this land, some of, our, of his predecessors fought to the north, like Oseko Jukwe, Oseko Jukwe, they fought to the north, and some fought to the south, among whom was Osebusu, 1800 to 1824, and then the eighth Asantehine, Seyakuto, who then also went to war in the coast. So you had Asante becoming a northern power, a middle power, and a coastal power. But then by the time that he became Asantehine, his uncle had been exiled. And as Professor Makaski has told us, his uncle knew that Assad had been so decimated that he could not continue to fight, and therefore he sacrificed himself and allowed himself to be captured by the British and Nazar to seize his life. So by the time my father came on the two, he followed his uncle's footsteps and said, no, I will not go to war, but I will turn the swords of my ancestors into pens and stethoscopes. How did he do that? He presided over the establishment of so many of the schools that were established here in Ghana. Primary schools, primary boys' schools, primary girls' schools. 
And then also, this very university here. Okay, thank you very much. You will appreciate. You, you will appreciate. But let me finish with this. Let, let me finish with this. In honor of my father, I have six children and 16 grandchildren. I'm paying 100,000 to make sure that each of my child and grandchild has a copy of this book. Thank you very much. Wow. 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 Please, a resounding round of applause for a celebration of a legacy well handed down. Nana Kwesia Beye is the son of the author of this book. Please, a round of applause. Thank you very much. We're gradually coming to the end of this event. We would like to acknowledge many contributions that are coming through. Please, don't be in a hurry. A lot more books have come through. At the end, we invite you to the table to make your offers. We'd like to acknowledge this one, particularly because of their name. Honorable Asante from Sikawo Bush. Hey, 10,000 Ghana cities. Please, a round of applause for Sikawo Bush. As we bring this event to a close, my Lord the Chair, Your Royal Majesty, Nananum, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in every kingdom, there are men and women who act as ambassadors, opening the frontiers of the kingdom for all to come through. Otum 482 did the same as he invited Confuanoche. Today, it has fallen to me, a man from Volta, by the generosity of my brother, a beloved son of Otum 4, a seasoned engineer fellow of the Ghana Institution of Engineers, chairman of the Board of Governors of the Millennium Excellence Foundation, and always serving as Santiman, a member of the Silver Jubilee Committee, Nana Ata Poku. Please help me appreciate him for giving me this opportunity to be part of this great kingdom. Your Royal Majesty, ever since your beloved son introduced me to you personally, you have taken a liking to me, encouraging me. But if I may make a matter of personal privilege, maybe it's unknown to you but my wife happens to be the grandniece of your loyal subject, the late Enumunyafio Apiamenka, in whose maternal grandmother's farm the golden stool was hidden. And that makes me Asante. And so 150 years on, here we are, a proud nation. We have recovered, we have bounced back, we have shown resilience. Today, what we've built is testament of the human spirit of Asante Man, one of respect, one of community, one of progress and prosperity. Let us leave this place emboldened and encouraged by the example of our forebears, knowing very well that we are a proud and resilient people based on our values and our principles. And no matter the odds, we rise to receive the blessings of God Almighty, after which we shall take some momentous photographs. Let's receive the chaplain of the KNUST, the Reverend Dr. Achampong, for the closing. Please let us pray. Our Lord and our Master, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We started this program in your name and by your grace. You have been with us, you've guided us, you've enabled us, especially all those who had to facilitate this program in one way or the other, making it so refreshing enlightening us and refreshing our memories and helping us to come to terms and appreciate the rich history that our forebears have bequeathed 
to us. We pray that you help us all as individuals and even as a kingdom to learn from all the virtues that our forefathers, poor parents left for us. We thank you for the silver jubilee of Otun Fo's accession to the throne. And we thank you for all the activities and programs that have been lined up. We pray that your spirit will continue to lead and guide us so that throughout the year, we'll have a successful and blissful celebration to the glory of your name. As we depart from here, may you lead, guide, and protect us. Take us safely to our various destinations, and we'll continue to praise and bless your name. There's are many more blessings we ask through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated briefly. Please be seated briefly. Humbly, I invite His Royal Majesty in the company of His Lordship the Chair, together with the Mamponghene and the Chair of the Council of We shall take a few photographs and then we'll be out of here. Professor Makaski, please join us. No, no, no. The second party will consist of the panelists and the moderator. I ask that you climb up. Moderator and panelists, please come through. Thank you, panelists and moderators. Ministers of State, please join us. Ministers of State. Ministers of State, please join us. Ministers of State. Please join us. Ministers of State. Members of the planning committee, please get ready. The last photograph will be with all Nana Ahimamu Epacho, all our Queen Mothers, at the request of His Majesty the King. Members of the planning committee, please come through.
Okay. Professor Anderson, together with all the Queen Mothers. Oh, Mipacho All our Queen Mothers, together with Professor Anderson, please. Professor Eugenia Anderson and all the Queen Mothers, please. We have refreshments at the back of the auditorium for all our invited guests. We encourage you to please make your way to the back. Speak with Prof on that one. And one last photograph with the cast and crew. One last photograph with the cast and crew of the reenacted Sagrenti War, 1874. Your Royal Majesty, your children, the cast and crew of the reenacted war would like to have a photo with you. The last photo. Thank you.